Hello and welcome to The Habitus. My name is Bobby Lowe, and as always, I'm here with the one and only... Michael Patterson. As usual, we have four unrelated films to talk about today. Um, I've chosen two. Michael has chosen two. We've each seen two of them. My first choice is Todd Browning's 1936 um, horror melodrama, The Devil Doll. And then Michael has chosen... Uh, so I've got um, All That Heaven Allows, the Douglas Sirk 1955 melodrama. Mm-hmm. And then I've got uh, the 1969 uh, horror thriller, Blind Beast. I like how all of these are like, uh, you know, we're not actually quite sure what this genre is. I like this. <laughs> I like this. Uh, to be discussed and as the episode of Finally. <laughs> yeah, so sorry, finally. Uh, and then we're going to end with a uh, discussion of Paradise Alley, so Sylvester Stallone's directorial debut from 1978. Okay, and first up we have The Devil Doll. This is wonderful, Devil. Now that you're free, we can go on with our work without being bothered by the police. No, Melita. My work is over, but I'm not free. Why, if they ever found out who I was, the police would want a lot of questions answered. What happened to Radin? Who paralyzed Coulve? No, Melita. When I proved my innocence, I condemn myself forever. We must get out of here. But before we go, we must destroy everything in the back room. No, no. The ghost of Marcel will curse you forever if you do. We've got to go on, Levon. We've got to carry out his plan. Now listen to me, Melita, and try to understand. I never had any plans beyond the vindication of my name, and I only wanted that because of my family. Through Marcel's wild schemes, I was able to do it. But we can't go on. Why, our work is hideous. We're cruel, and it's got to come to an end tonight. No, Levon, you can't do this. I won't let you betray Marcel. If you go away, I will carry out his work alone. Do you understand that? Alone. Okay, so The Devil Doll uh, was produced by MGM, directed by Todd Browning, written by Guy Endor, Garrett Ford, and uh, Eric von Stroheim, although I read that very little of Stroheim's uh, material actually made it into the finished film, um, from a story by Todd Browning that was loosely based on the novel Burn Witch Burn by Abraham Merritt. Uh, The film was released in July of 1936, and it was a kind of modest, kind of like box office disappointment. Uh, not as catastrophic as Freaks had been for Browning a few years previously, but it was kind of another signal that his career was kind of coming to an end. He re- ended up retiring mm-hmm. in 1939 <clears throat> uh, at quite a young age. I think he was 57. Um, okay, so this one, uh, the plot. So, um, framed for embezzlement and murder by his three colleagues, banker Paul Levand, played by Lionel Barrymore, breaks out of prison on Devil's Island after seven years uh, consumed by thoughts of revenge. Um, his collaborator in the jailbreak is a scientist named Marcel, played by Henry B. Walthall. Uh, he takes him to his home, where, together with his wife Melita, played by Rafaela Atiana, he demonstrates the fruits of his life's work, a uh, technology for reducing living creatures to one-sixth their size, um, which also happens to have the unfortunate side effect of removing the creature's intelligence and free will, requiring a kind of uh, psychic puppet master to telepathically will them into action. Um, when Marcel suddenly dies of a heart attack, Levand agrees to help Melita continue their work with the intention of using the technology against his enemies. Moving with Melita to Paris, Levand disguises himself as a kindly old woman and maker of exotic toys using the name mm-hmm. Madame Mandalip. As incognito, he befriends his estranged daughter, uh, played by Maureen O'Sullivan, and also schemes against his three former colleagues. And that's about... And that's all you need to know about that film. So moving on to the next one. <laughs> um, so you'd seen this before. Yeah, I saw it a long time it ago. To me. Did you assign it for this episode because you were excited to rewatch it, or you know how much of it did you remember? Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't quite as I remembered it. Uh, primarily, it's it's not as action packed as I remembered it being. Mm, there yeah. aren't that many kind of set pieces. Yeah. Um, I was kind of I was kind of surprised by that. There are kind of two major set pieces. Um, but what did, what did you think of it? Well, you mentioned it in the introduction that it's a horror slash melodrama. Mm-hmm. I went into it 
without any expectations. It was on my radar only as a Browning film. I believe it's his penultimate film. He only made one more after this. Um, I've seen... So I, I'm a massive, massive fan of The Unknown, his silent film mm-hmm. with uh, Lon Chaney. Yeah, I'm a big, big fan of that. Um, not so keen on Dracula. And I think Dracula, bear... Dracula's kind of a mixed bag, I think. Yeah, it's it's very flabby. Um, at the same time as being extremely iconic, uh, which, well, anyway. Um, and I can barely really remember Freaks beyond watching it in the context as a young cinephile in the making, knowing of its reputation before I watched it and not really feeling any affinity towards it or anything against it, just feeling a bit, meh, whatever. I've watched it. It's another one to tick off. So Yeah, I'm very watched, fond of freaks. I, you are? Okay. Yeah. So I approached this not really knowing what to expect. Um, interestingly, in reading about it after, uh, between watching it and recording this, um, I read a, a few sort of reviews by critics on Letterboxd and wherever else um, who were obviously watching it like us from a from a 21st century vantage point. And there's a certain consensus that seems to have formed around the film that responds to the horror elements, but is then very derisive of the melodramatic elements. And we'll get into right. melodrama in more depth when we discuss all that heaven allows. Um, and the sorts of consensus that form around them. Um, I I <laughs> I found myself really responding to that mix, though, uh, as an unusual, unique, extremely weird thing in itself. This is such an unusual film, right? Yeah, it's I very weird. I yeah. think the fact that it's set in Paris makes it weird. It doesn't have to be, but it is. Yeah. Uh, the fact that... Um, Paul Lavond, played by Barry Moore, as you said, has this daughter who he with whom he wants to reconcile, who believes that um he is responsible for the crimes for which he was put away. Yeah, which also um, resulted in her mother's early death from like yeah, you know, uh, like all of these like un- unnecessarily complicating factors that like sort of drag it. Uh, intermittently into that melodramatic mode um even the prologue like the lengthy prologue so i had no idea what the story of this was and how it was going to end up the fact that paul levond escapes devil's island with marcel this like scientist who's on the verge of this like amazing scientific discovery are we told are we told why marcel was in jail originally (laughs) <laughs> I can't remember. He's just such an otherwise nice guy. Yeah. Uh, and um, then, of course, you get because his his uh, his um he and Melita's uh, intentions, like what they want to do with the technology, is they want to shrink yeah. the world's population to one sixth the size. Yeah, so it's, that it's the world's Alexander food Payne's... supply. The world's world's food supply will go six times further. It's downsizing. Yeah, right? yeah exactly. That's yeah, the yeah, premise yeah. of downsizing. Um. And then you so you, you know you get that weird prologue which is so um sort of stilted and slow to the point at which I presumed early doors that this was going to be the film that it was going to be a film about Paul and Marcel and that scientific discovery and you know the joys of uh, and the like the cinematic techniques that can be deployed in service of that when it then becomes a completely different film altogether, uh, and it you know uh, goes to Paris, the story itself, so like the actual premise of the film, is just so weird because it becomes this like, like revenge plot mm-hmm. that yeah. entails set pieces, which then intermittently make it a horror film. So it's it's like three kinds of different films in one. Yeah. Um, well, it's, it's interesting because the, the melodrama um, elements of it, like Maureen O'Sullivan, who plays his daughter Lorraine, mm. and Frank Lawton, who plays her fiance Toto, mm. uh, they're second build after Barrymore. Yeah. Um, but they occupy very, very little of the screen time. Yeah. They have a couple of scenes together, and then they they show up at the end. Uh, 
Particularly yeah, Toto. A, Toto. Toto has a very, very small role to play, even in terms of like you know how he how he relates to either. You know, like Lorraine's purpose is in the context of her relationship to Lavand. Yeah. And Toto's purpose is in the context of his relationship to Lorraine. But Lorraine has very little screen time. Um, Toto and because of that, because of that, Toto feels like he's just hanging around the laundrette where Lorraine works and wanting to sort of, you know, ask her out on dates and stuff. And he knows as little about her as her father Baldur's. It seems like it's a slim seventy nine or eighty. No, it's eighty six minutes. This no, it's shorter. Seventy nine minutes. It's seventy nine minutes. Okay, yeah. the internet says seventy nine for some reason. I had it down as eighty six, but uh, whatever. Um, so, <laughs> I would, I wouldn't want to. Uh, I wouldn't want the film to be any longer. I think you know whatever, but it, it is pretty slim. Um, but I'd mean, be happy if you... I'd be happy if it was longer. If the time was taken up with another set piece, like the set piece where. Uh, uh, Levant sends um, the the shrunken woman into the guy's bedroom to steal his wife's jewels and uh, stab him with the little uh, the little um, stiletto. So that's the set piece of the film for me. Yeah, sure. The, the set piece for which, like, a giant sized uh, furniture was built, mm-hmm. and then you know. You've got white, extreme white shots of the doll, the devil doll, an actual person, like negotiating that furniture and climbing over it. So it's a suspense piece, but it's also like our attention is also drawn to the the awesome qualities of that set that was being constructed, right? Yeah. Uh, and the doll, the doll's movements apparently are modeled on uh, a kind of uh, signature dance. That um, a street gang called the Apache, uh, who were involved in theft and prostitution and murder in Paris before World, World War One, uh, used to perform like a kind of a, oh, really? a signature dance, yeah. And they they're costumed to resemble them too. Um, mm. That's the kind of the weird sort of dancing kind of movements that the doll does as it, as it as it moves. Um, this film has a has an interesting production history, which could account partly for its. Uh, it's sort of strangeness okay um, because it started out as a more straightforward kind of more familiar concept okay so i'm getting this from an essay called violence women and disability in todd browning's freaks and the devil doll by uh, martin f norton and madeline cowell uh, where they're just talking about um the film's production history uh and how it was originally this voodoo witchcraft film called the witch of timbuktu um mm-hmm. where uh, Melita, the woman, the character named Melita in this one was originally named Nilita, and she was a black woman from the Belgian Congo who practices voodoo and witchcraft, and who also happens to be the mother of Baula, the man who escapes with the Levant character, who in this version was named Duval uh, mm-hmm. from Devil's Island. Um, and in the Witch of Timbuktu, Nilita travels with Duval to Paris to help exact revenge on the three conspirators who contrived his downfall. Um, Duval disguises himself as an old woman and opens a doll shop to cover his and Nilita's operation, so that's the same as the finished film. Um, in The Witch of Timbuktu, they, they abduct a small crew of gypsy-like criminals from a low-class dive and shrink them, arm them with tiny poison-tipped swords, and manipulate them through mind control. Uh, so it sounds like there was more of that in The Witch of Timbuktu script. Yeah. Um, MGM was forced to make radical changes in the story. <clears throat> in response to censorship pressures from both Hollywood's internal regulatory agency, the Production Code Administration, and uh, also from uh, British censors. Um, the Production Code Administration just, you know, they, they had problems with the amount of violence and, and so on in it. Mm. But uh, the British censors had much stronger objections and made suggestions that would affect the film's entire narrative structure. Um, they were concerned that uh, Nailita and Baula would incite black people in the British Empire and they demanded the removal of all black characters and all references to voodoo and witchcraft. Um, wow. And since since Britain was an important market for MGM's films, the studio obliged, and uh, the writers were suddenly tasked with completely, you know, rebuilding the concept from the ground up, like removing the the witchcraft and voodoo, uh, and they turned it into a kind of a more traditional mad scientist story, um, along the lines of Frankenstein, and changed the black African mother and son, Nailita and Baula, into the white European wife and husband, Melita and Marcel. Um, it kind of uh, explains the weird sort of 
cobbled together feeling of the film. It does. I wonder the extent to which the the version you describe is it is is indebted to the source material, A. Merritt's Spurn Witch Burn, um, mm-hmm. about which I don't know anything, to be honest. Um, but interestingly, I'm re- I read that the American science fiction magazine at the time uh, called the film, uh, sorry, the magazine was Thrilling Wonder Stories. But A. Merritt, obviously, uh, a newspaper uh, known for his uh, science fiction fantasy novels, uh, that magazine, with a science fiction remit, responded to the film um, calling it a disappointment and as a run-of-the-mill thriller which does not attempt to recapture the unique fantasy of Merritt's novel, um, which suggests that the imposed changes uh, did dramatically sort of shift it away from the novel. Hmm. Um, I mean, even even you know, judging the film, the the original title of the film, you know, it, it sounds like uh, Nylita yeah. was the main character. She, yeah. she's the witch. She's the witch of Timbuktu. Sure. Uh, yeah. Two good titles. Um, I like Burn Witch Burn um, and its evocations and its imagery, but I also like the Devil Doll. The Devil Doll um, is a good, is, but it but it 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 doesn't seem to fit the content of the film though. Because it actually does when you th- when you realize oh okay well this was originally a voodoo story, well yes. the devil doll suits that you know but this is not a voodoo story, no, uh, and there's nothing kind of devilish about these dolls really at all. Although they're just, there they're is just a... little, they're just sort of little homunculi that do whatever they're yeah. sort of psych- psychically instructed to do. I love I love the idea. <laughs> it's, it's it's you know you just have to sort of make this assumption. It's never made explicit, but uh, when Marcel is explaining how the technology works, he's explaining. You know, you know that all living things are made up of atoms, and atoms are made up of electrons. Well, I've figured out a way to shrink. What does he say? Shrink the atoms, or shrink the space between yeah. the atoms, or some some whatever it is. Uh, and then he just sort of like, you know, a bit of hand waving about like, oh yeah, this removes the creature's free will. Um, <laughs> but it so it makes them susceptible to psychic instruction. But the implication then is that like people have like normal people who haven't been shrunk have this. Yeah. Sign ability to telepathically communicate. It's like all the only thing standing in their way is is that you know people's atoms are too close together or something. Yeah, well, it's um, it's, it's it like reminds me of Ant Man as well in the Marvel universe, like being able to connect with the ants when yeah, he's oh, tiny, sure, yeah, yeah. when he's tiny little. Um, yeah, because the, first, the what I was going to say, I do like the darkness that creeps into this film, though it being a Browning film that there when it when when it does touch upon like dark scenarios and those kinds of currents, I think it's really suggestive. So, like um, when Marcel's explaining the the technology to Levand and uh, the, the 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 woman on whom they test uh, successfully is the inbred peasant halfwit from a Berlin slum. That's how they describe <laughs> her, and you know, so the exploitation involved in this. Uh, scientific endeavor I like uh, that it touches upon and also the darkness of like so the devil dolls in question they're not killing the victims they're paralyzing them they're paralyzing just rendering them completely like mute and like uh, you know unable to sort of communicate in any way Um, Levon's first victim his the first of his three former colleagues uh, mm. Ultimately, he shrinks him down as well, doesn't he? He gets him to come to the shop. He tries to he, he posing as we haven't even t- spoken about Madame Mandelip. Well, we get to that. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, he comes to when his office to dre- dressed as Madame Mandelip. Uh, you know this this maker of exotic toys. He brings him a, a toy, you know, quote unquote toy horse. Yeah. It's actually a shrunk, you know, horse shrunk down using this this uh, Marcel's technology. Yeah, and uh, demonstrates to uh, Victor Radan. Yeah. Yeah, uh, his first his first victim, um, he you know tells Victor to just you know will the horse to stand up and will the horse to walk around and the horse kind of trots around on his desk and he's going oh faster faster uh, and that's 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 the way that he lures him to his toy shop, but then he shrinks yeah. him down and he becomes one mm. of his devil dolls, mm. uh, so that's kind of what he's up to. He's um, yeah he's he yeah exactly yeah he's not he's not really trying to kill them he's trying to uh, turn them into these weird little slaves. Well, and I think the, I think the, the the really the really funny thing about the the trajectory of the film is that 
when we are first introduced to Marcel and Melita, they're talking about all the good that this they're they're giving you the Alexander Payne downsizing kind of thing where yeah, it's yeah. like you know this this if if we just shrunk everybody down then our resources would go that much further, but Marcel dies and then it's like Melita just completely forgets about that and then later on, you know you see that her primary interest is just like playing with the toys. She's just like having them kind of dancing with each other on the table, and yeah, she kind of forgets all about that, um, and it turns <laughs> turn, turns into turns into a, like a real kind of like you know mad scientist kind of character, mm. where she's she's kind of obsessed with shrinking people down just to shrink them down. Yeah, because the ultimate. Um, so is it Coulve, who Emil Coulve, the second victim who he paralyzes, yeah, I believe, that's, that's, yeah, that's and right. then the the overall purpose is then to just induce so it does them is obviously wanted by the police in connection who know he's escaped from prison they mm-hmm. don't know who he is or where he is because he's obviously disguised as a woman a toy making yeah. uh toy making woman um and then threatens the would-be third victim that uh, um charles writes in the note doesn't he uh you shall likewise enter the shadow of death come come the hour of yeah midnight tenth, yeah. come the 10th hour or whatever um and from that the, the would-be third victim confesses uh, to the fact that they framed Levand, uh, which ultimately frees him and clears his name, much to the delight of daughter Lorraine. That all happens, and there's still 20 or so minutes to go. Like, So his name's cleared, there's the climax, yeah. and then we've still got 20 minutes to go. So we've got like yeah. a kind of a... Uh, diminuendo, if you like, after this, like you know, build up um, of a sentimental wrap up where he sort of, you know, reconciles with his daughter, although she's not aware of who he is. But his name is cleared of his original crimes, but he he yeah. also has the crimes that he's committed since escaping from prison, which is the reason <laughs> that he has to then yeah. uh, he he can't spend he can't continue to see his daughter. He has to like yeah, yeah. F- flee Paris, but obviously the. His, you know, his exoneration for the crimes that that caused his daughter to hate him is more important yeah. to him. Yeah, yeah. sure. Um, yeah, I, you know, I could I could see this as an ongoing TV series made today, where like you know, like each episode, his attempts to tell his daughter is thwarted by something, and it becomes this ongoing, long running series about his attempt to clear his name. Um, I found that I found the I found the like the final wrap up surprisingly moving though. Having not, and I'm surprised, and I say surprising because, like yourself, you know, like I hadn't invested any sort of time or effort or energy in the relationship with uh, Lorraine or her relationship with Toto or anything like that. It all centers around Lionel Barrymore's performance, I guess, as Paul, as the man who eventually clears his name and has that cathartic sort of encounter with his daughter but under the under the guise of somebody else so he he pretends basically to be marcel the guy who had escaped prison with lorraine's father and tells her how much her father loved her and stuff like that everything that she wants to hear although his 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 identity sort of displaced into this other person um so yeah i found it surprisingly sort of moving in the end i don't know how about you uh, I would say the melodrama element of it is is the weakest, and I would have liked more. Uh, I think I think the parts of it that have aged best are the parts of it that are kind of like uh, sort of high horror camp in the kind of the vein of you know the films that James Whale made. Like the, when you look at like mm. Frankenstein, The Invisible Man, Bride of Frankenstein, mm-hmm. and, and the way that they have aged uh, compared to certainly compared to something like Dracula, but even compared to something another like excellent film from the period something like the mummy or uh, mm. the wolfman um which i think are great films but they the the sensibility that whale sort of pioneered in those uh in, in the particularly in the frankenstein films mm. uh feels like something that wouldn't sort of really become popular or dominant until the 80s the 1980s yeah you know when you had films like reanimator and yeah, I was gonna e- say, evil yeah. dead and things yeah, like that yeah. where it's like uh, very tongue in cheek, um, but very tongue in cheek, very darkly comic, um, sort of macabre tales like that, mm-hmm. um, and this falls into that category I think really well for kind of maybe fifty percent of its running time. And I, a big part of that is 
the Madame Mandelip thing, you know, where he has yeah. to disguise himself as somebody, and like he just just creates this character, Madame Mandelip, who's this like kindly old woman um, yes. who makes makes exotic toys and speaks in that kind of voice and fools everybody. <laughs> So a toy horse. <laughs> what do you make of the uh, performance? Because like a I lot love, of I a lot Barry being Warren made that. by the critics writing from a, a you know our own vantage point, uh, just seeing like you know scenery chewing, like you know hamming it right up, yeah. you know unnecessarily. You know, I, I yeah, yeah. I mean, like I obviously, Lionel Barrymore is known to people through "It's a Wonderful Life." As sure. the villainous banker, not as the cross-dressing Madam Man, Man- <laughs> from uh, the Devil Doll. <laughs> it's quite a different performance, but um, you know he's got presence though, right? And it and it adds to the darkness of the film that like he's not doing this out of pleasure, although one can surmise certain pleasurable moments in the process I think of that's, revenge. I think that's a kind of a weakness of it. I have to say, that, I think yeah. I just don't really. I don't like structurally. I don't really understand the purpose. I it it seems it seems like it would be more fun if the film was about Marcel or if you know Lavand was the scientist. Sure, yeah. And I just don't understand why you need both. Um, and yeah, yeah, like, like he's reluctantly like consuming. This, yeah, yeah, like this consuming desire for revenge, and he's kind of like at certain. He's obviously relishing it <laughs> while he's actually <laughs> taking revenge. Um, but then whenever he's speaking to Melita about it. Melita kind of serves this function. She kind of comes in later on in the story, and she's the mad scientist. Then, and yeah, she she kind of uh, is introduced as this kind of like eleventh hour antagonist, mm-hmm. um, where she she well she turns on Levand and tries to paralyze him to shrink him down. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I don't know. I, I think I, I would have preferred a little bit more sort of a little bit little bit less of a sort of a moral sensibility to it. You know. Mm-hmm. Where yeah, he's yeah. kind of like he—he's you know what we're doing is horrible and we have to stop. Uh, I prefer if he was just really into it. Yeah, <laughs> like just from the start. Yeah, like he—he—he he, he doesn't you know begin to cross dress out of necessity. He wants to. He wants to do it. Um, but I mean that's part of that is just like the haze card thing. Yeah. So what what was it out of ten before you rewatched it? Uh, I had I had it at a nine, and I had to pull it down to an eight. Right. Uh, I, I I mean, there are parts of it that I absolutely love, and I when I was watching them, I was like, oh yeah, I remember. This is why I loved it so much. Like yeah, yeah. Um, a uh, big part of that is the is the like absurdity of the Madame Mandelip thing, and the visual effects. Because I, I was thinking like, just in, just on a plot level, and a on a concept level, you could very easily do a remake of this today. But oh, it wouldn't yeah. be as fun because of the I techniques think... that would be used. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like the, yeah, part of yeah, it is no, part of it. it is the giant sets and the the you know double exposure and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But, uh, I think if I think if it had one more set piece, like the the um, attack on on uh, Coulvey, yeah, I think I, I, it would probably be, and I might I might kind of downplay the melodrama element of it as well. Um, oh, you! Oh, you might. Okay, I might. Yeah, yeah of course. You do, do you know? <laughs> do, do you know the? Um, I I was looking at Lionel Barrymore in this role, yeah. all the way through the film, trying to remember, like trying to like identify who it was he reminded me of. Um, and I think at times he looks really like Denholm Elliot. You know, like oh played, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, in uh-huh. Trading Places, the Butler. Yeah, it's really striking resemblance in certain shots. <laughs> anyway, what what did you what did you think of it? Okay. Yeah, no, as I said, I liked it, and you know, I obviously it shape shifts quite early on into a very different film to what the prologue sets out sets it out to be. Um, I, I mean, I think it could it, it could either do with being expanded, or it could do with being sort of truncated into like a sixty minute film, which you know wasn't that uncommon in the sure. uh, in the thirties. Yeah. I'm going to give it like a high seven bordering an eight. Um, okay. It's definitely a star on my uh, system. <laughs> I was just about to say, you're man in your stars. <laughs> um, <laughs> but as I said, you know, a large part of that is its weirdness and whether that weirdness comes yeah, from yeah, the material yeah. or cuts imposed upon it or changes to the script imposed upon it. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's a bit of a mangled film to watch, uh, which which adds to the sort of unusual nature and interest, I suppose. Yeah, I think if it had gone ahead with the the witch, the witch of Timbuktu, 
Mm. It wouldn't have been anywhere near as strange. No. No. Uh, have you seen uh, the uh, pff, any other films uh, b- collaborating between Lionel Barrymore and Todd Browning? I believe the one that they made together before this was a Dracula, uh, Mark of the Vampire. Oh, Mark of the Vampire, yeah, I've seen that. Have you I seen that? Like What's that. it like? I liked it. Right. Um, it doesn't have a good reputation, but I remember being surprised mm. by it. Quite atmospheric and interesting. From what I understand, Barrymore is, is on sort of scenery chewing mode as well in that. Having it right up, but uh, in like, mine's like, clothes. Yeah, that that doesn't sound like a bad thing to me. Though. I don't. It's, it's, do you think scenery chewing is a bad thing? It's it's always sort of frowned upon, unless it's like Daniel Day Lewis, and even then, some people like think, oh well, you know, he's just been given like free reign to do whatever he wants. No, I don't think it's a bad thing. I don't uh, know. I mean, it depends all. on the context. Um, yeah, I mean, like, the, the funnily enough, the actors who do it are also capable of really understating things as well and underplaying stuff. Hmm. You know, like, everyone says, you know, Jack Nicholson, but, you know, Nicholson's capable of subtlety as well, uh, as is Pacino. You know, it's actors who, yeah. like, um, Jesse Eisenberg, who can't, like, sleep in a scene without overacting. <laughs> um, <laughs> who, who kind of uh, reveal their limitations by overacting, but... No, I don't think it is. No, but I, I was just referring to the fact that it's always sort of picked up on by uh, most of those. Should we move on? Let's move on to all that heaven allows. Mona certainly didn't waste any time, did she? I suppose the whole town's talking about it. Well, she phoned me. That's why I rushed over. Of course, I didn't believe a word. You should. You can't be serious. Your gardener? He isn't my gardener. He did work on the trees. You met him. And even if he was, I'm in love with him. And I'm going to marry him. Well, all right, maybe I'm a snob. But it isn't just a question of whether he's a gardener. The talk won't stop at that. They'll say he's younger than you are. And the fact that you're a widow... And what has that got to do with it? With money. Ron isn't interested in my money. And that he worked at your place while Martin was still alive. Well, people will say that all this started before your husband died. But that's not true. You... I don't. But Mona? Oh, Mona will have a field day. Before she gets through, the whole town will believe it. You know, Carrie, as well as I do, that situations like this... Bring out the hateful side of human nature. Remember, you have Ned and Kay to think about. At their age, what people say matters terribly. Have you stopped to think what all these rumors will do to them? You're asking me to give up Ron because of something in people that's mean and contemptible. I didn't think Do you really think it would be good for Ned and Kay if I were to let myself be beaten by such hatefulness? Well, I'm not going to do it. Let them say what they want to. And that goes for you too, Sarah. Okay, so All That Heaven Allows, released 1955 by Universal International, uh, directed by Douglas Sirk, produced by Ross Hunter, written by Feg, uh, sorry, written by Peg Fennick, based on a a novel, I believe, a very long novel by Edna and Harry Lee. Um, Cinematography, going to point that out because I think we'll return to it, Mm -hmm. by Russell Metty. Uh, and the film, the synopsis is that recently widowed uh, Carrie Scott, played by Jane Wyman, living in Stonington, uh, an affluent New England town, lives with her two children, Kay, uh, played by Gloria Talbot, and Ned William Reynolds. They're kind of on the cusp of going to college, moving away. Uh, and she begins to resume her social life following a period in which she's been mourning the death of her husband. Uh, Carrie meets and befriends uh, Ron Kirby, played by Rock Hudson, uh, the neighbourhood's gardener and a landscape designer whose worldview and general outlook on life, let's say, is ostensibly at odds with Carrie's wealthy, status-obsessed, middle-class milieu. Anyway, they meet, they fall in love, they get engaged, and then when Carrie starts to sort of uh, introduce Ron into her milieu, into her um, social gatherings, etc., 
she finds herself uh, alienated and borderline disowned by her own community, um, including by her two children, Kay and Ned, and so breaks off the engagement. We leave it there because I think uh, that's kind of it. Um, uh, kind of it in terms of the setup of the film, anyway. Um, now, the reason I wanted us to watch this, I'm watching it for the second time. I watched it many years ago um, when I was at a stage in my cinephilic discoveries that weren't, I'm going to say, sophisticated or mature enough to connect with melodrama, right? Um, although I always respected and admired the film, uh, I suspect a large part of that respect and admiration was informed by, you know, being guided by what consensus in the canon said and all that and what was important and what wasn't. Um, the reason I wanted us to watch it for this episode was sort of going back to Christian Petzold and Phoenix, to which I know you didn't respond in the previous episode, um, I wanted to return to Douglas Sirk because of the way Petzold seems throughout his career to have reworked melodrama into this like straight, straight edge uh, kind of arrow, arrow linear thing, with you know without the sort of colourful furnishings that Sirk's films have. Uh, where are you at with melodrama in general? Let's say nineteen fifties melodrama. Um. Well, if we're going to talk about melodrama, I think we have to. The the, the meaning of the term has kind of mutated. Mm. Where, like, if you read old interviews with Alfred Hitchcock, he talks about uh, how he he felt that he could only do melodrama. But when we think of Hitchcock now, we don't think of Hitchcock. No, I mean, we obviously, there are yeah. a couple of exceptions, but what he meant by melodrama was films dealing with kind of uh, sort of heightened emotional states out of the ordinary kind of things like films about murders and you know intrigue and things like that yes uh which is not what we now mean by melodrama melodrama the the, the definition of melodrama has narrowed to um kind of what you would consider sort of romantic melodrama i guess right yeah i mean like when you say petzold like the the premise of phoenix um is you know uh, superficially Hitchcockian. Um, it's not really a, like a romantic melodrama. It's more like a suspense melodrama kind of thing. Um, yeah, I mean, it's but it's, this, it's... But, when, but certainly when I when I hear the when I when I hear the word melodrama, I think of something like all, what, all that heaven allows, or like more recently, like the films of somebody like Todd Haynes, right? So like Carol and Far from Heaven, which is loosely based on yeah, sure uh, on this. Um, but to answer your question, I have not seen that many of them. And okay, it wouldn't be a genre that I'm hugely drawn to. No, it's not a natural uh, connection. I had, I had, I had seen this before, uh, and I, I re it was interesting because I remembered not really having liked it that much. Yeah, like not, I, I, I think the rating that I had entered was six out of ten. Okay, um, but I, re I remembered having a problem with uh, the kids in it, her kids, right? Um, uh. Gloria, and Ned. sorry, no, Kay and, Kay, and Kay, and, Kay and Ned played by Gloria Talbot and William Reynolds. Uh, I couldn't, I couldn't remember specifically what the problem was. So when I was rewatching it this time, I was waiting for, I was waiting to have that same experience again, yeah. and I didn't really. Okay. Um, but I remember, I remembered comparing it to Michael Curtis's uh, Mildred Pierce, right? And in that film, feeling at a certain point like the way that the daughter was behaving toward the mother, the, the degree, not so much the degree maybe, but the, the form of the devotion that the mother was expressing toward the daughter was sort of like, I don't know, put me at odds with her, put me at odds with the mother. Like mm. there's a, like feeling like there's a way for you to, like, you don't need to cut your daughter out of your life, but you need to like draw a line here and say, no, you can't have that. You, you, mm. you know, I'm not going to do that for you. Um, you can't behave this way, that kind of thing. And, I guess maybe that was the way that I felt about this film the first time. Like, you know, she needs to just like tell her kids to fuck off. You know, yeah. So as I said <laughs> like... in my synopsis, uh, they, you know, they threaten to disown her. Basically, um, yeah. Kay has an argument with her boyfriend that we don't see, but she comes rushing home and mm. basically puts it on her mother, Carrie, that. It's it's carries as a mother's new relationship with Ron that's causing sort of mm. gossip around town, and basically 
guilt trips her into breaking off the engagement. And then what what makes it so despicable? What makes Kay so blood boilingly irritating in this? Mm. Um, is that when later on, when at Christmas, when Carrie's obviously having a shitty time because of her breaking off the engagement with Ron, you know, she mentions that in response to Kay announcing her engagement to her boyfriend. Yeah. And then, you know, and then, and then Kay Kay's just immediately like, apologetic. Yeah, she's yeah. just, oh, you shouldn't listen to me. You shouldn't let me, you know, control your she's life. She's like, oh, oh, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Yeah. You know, I, I, I never meant to hurt you. Yeah. And, uh, and and also the the son Ned, mm. uh, when when Carrie suggests to him that she and uh, Ron the Rock Hudson are going to potentially sell the house, yeah, um, <laughs> they're going to move to like this this what is it like a it's a it's an old windmill or something like that or like a, yeah. isn't it yeah that he's converted into like this very yeah, kind of yeah. rustic little homestead. Uh, he flips out altogether and he's like you know like how could you do this to father? Like, you know, her, his father is dead and, you know, the father's mm. memory and this is yeah. our childhood home. And how could you even think about selling it? And then, yeah, like you mentioned, like at, at that, is it supposed to be that Christmas or is, I don't think we're given a yeah, precise time no, scale. I, it is. It's like, it's a, it's the, in, everything of the, of the film takes, sorry, takes place within his single year, I think. Cause it's their first okay. time away. And then they come back for the Christmas, I think. Okay. From college. Yeah, uh, first semester. But yeah, but, but he's he's then talking about he's talking about selling the house. Yeah, you know, and it's like, oh, you, you don't want to be here pottering around on your own. It's too yeah. too much house for one woman. Uh, you know, so they basically yeah. So like, so how long would you say it is between the big uh, falling out that they have and this Christmas? Well, it's about ten minutes of screen time. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know, like. It's a season, right? Because we get the transition between seasons. It goes from like summer to that Christmas, mm. or like on the cusp of like autumn. Because uh, so it's a few months. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's it. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I mean, I so think they're it's just a... they're just a pair of like absolute assholes. <laughs> and I, I just Complete I don't know spoiled brats. Yeah, yeah. Um, you have to feel you have to feel for Curry, and you do feel for Curry. It's a great performance yeah. by Jane Wyman here, like and the the way she seems to spend much of the film out without um in scenes without Ron uh Ron the Rock Hudson that didn't go uh unnoticed by the way when you said that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um in scenes without him so with others. She seems to spend much of her time in reaction shots and containing emotion and containing, you know, her growing impulses that she's having to hold and contain because of social pressures. I think this is a very, very um, rich, acute portrait of social social escalations and hysteria, basically, uh, and of the milieu. And, like... It's it seems extremely, um, sort of on the nose and over the top now, and I don't think it helps its cause. I don't think its cause is helped. Sorry, by the fact that Rock Hudson is so tall and dashing and otherwise lacking in any sort of visibly working class credentials. Sure, but he is he yeah. is like obviously very different. Um, in his his character anyway is very different to that of. Carry, yeah. I mean, part of it, like aside from his his class position, part of it is his like ideological commitment to this kind yeah. of like uh, rugged individualism, and uh, mm. you know, like he we see a copy of uh, Walden that he's been yep. reading, you know, all about yep. like this kind of idyllic, yeah, uh, you know, like individualistic utopian vision of like you know uh, living in nature and, and yeah and, you know yeah autonomy uh, and independence yeah, and yeah, whatever yeah, else yeah, yeah. Uh, so that that in itself represents something almost unconscionable to the people in Carrie's life you know that the idea that Carrie would choose that over what she has which is like money mm-hmm. and status and uh, mm-hmm. you know community and so far as it goes um, yeah so no I, I mean I agree I, 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 I don't think the class element is it's obviously there, but it's uh, it's not there the way that, the, say, the racial element is in, in Todd Haynes' Far From Heaven. 
Or indeed, um, Inferior Reach the Soul, the Fassbinder remake. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with all of that. I also like how it touches upon different senses of time and therefore patience and how that's informed by a culture because Carrie's milieu seems very much dictated by sort of the short-term palpable goal-driven aims of capitalism itself, short-termism. And then Ron's is very much informed by a sort of a, a more natural or we might even say a geological um, temporal plane, um, which is complicated by... So, for instance, when one of his early conversations with Carrie is to do with planting trees and, you know, the time given and invested in that, and then you see the fruit that that yields in a tree that grows over the course of a decade or whatever else. Um, but then when it comes to marriage, he's a little bit impatient there, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> he loses that uh, otherwise impossibly understanding veneer that he has. Um, yeah. So when Carrie suggests merely postponing the thing, maybe they are rushing it to a little bit too much. Maybe the maybe her climate or, or social class sorry, does need a little bit more time to get to grips with the fact that she's going to marry a gardener. Hmm. He's pretty quick to uh, <laughs> dismiss her entire way of life, I must say. Emotions are a fickle thing, of course. Um, so that's, I think, at, at, at odds with his otherwise sort of uh, intransigent, uh, let's say class consciousness, but I know what you mean when you say it goes beyond that. Um, and then, of course, we return to that at the end of the film when he's had an accident and he's fallen off a snowy <laughs> cliff. Uh, rendered, let's say, he's going to survive, but it's going to be a long road to recovery. And, uh, you know, he's told, uh, or Carrie's told that, or sorry, is it Carrie that tells him that um, he needs time to recover? Um so I suppose yeah, there's, there's, a, doctor, there's a doctors there as well. So. Yeah, there's a merging between you know his his slow durational sense of life and the fact that she's going to come round to that or the community will through his recovery. Um, so what do you think of the ending? Well, apparently Cirque wanted Ron to die. Okay. Uh, spoiler alert: He doesn't. Um. But uh, apparently uh, the producers wanted a more optimistic ending. Um, you, do, do you have a problem with it? I hate the ending. Really? Why? Yeah. I th well, I, I first of all think the scene where he falls off the cliff is just so silly. It's so hilarious. Um, <laughs> it's as like, if it doesn't have it doesn't have there. anything. It doesn't have anything to do with the like. It's not it's like the si the situation that you know you've been watching unfold and develop. <laughs> Doesn't yeah. like conspire to make him fall off a cliff. It's just this, <laughs> it's just this random like tragedy. Um, yeah, and then the fact that he doesn't, he you know, he doesn't die. Like it's, uh, I, yeah. I think the ending, like because the 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 way that it builds and and develops, mm. uh, is so effective, to the point of actually I think making for uncomfortable viewing. Like mm. when you, for me at least the the dramatization of that kind of like. Um, paralyzing inertia in her yeah. life like she wants change but she can't change she can't yes. pursue it and there are, there's, there's this sort of uh <clears throat> like really incisive dramatization of like the tyranny of other people's expectations and yeah 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 uh the the immense like psychic difficulty of of uh breaking out of of, of disregarding that of, of you know yeah throwing that off in the way that that uh, Ron, we're you know we're told so easily has done for his whole life, just kind of shrugged off yeah. what when any what anyone else wants. Yeah. Uh, for most people, that is not easy to do. So yeah, like yeah. Ron, Ron does re represent the kind of the the, the Walden sort of uh, ideal. Um, but in order for that to really pay off, I think that they can't end up together. You know. <laughs> like it can't be solved by the fact that he fell off a cliff. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I agree. I agree. Uh, the implications seem to be at odds with what the film is driving at. Um, I'm just trying to process that and think up very quickly or, or improvise some sort of rebuke. Um, 
I mean, it's as if he has he's never lived at the place. I mean, he he knows the lay of the land. He knows where that cliff is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and just the fact that a little bit of snow. There's a similar moment actually in Pet Salt's Jericho, in which a character just like inexplicably nearly falls off a cliff at the beach. Um, and it's a really pivotal dramatic moment. But uh, yeah, kind of predicated on on silly the silly suspension of disbelief. Um, I don't hate the ending. I don't think it like I don't think it undermines or undercuts anything severely that we've seen. The implication is because I I don't I don't read that Ron and Carrie's happy happy existence thereafter is guaranteed. I think it's it, the film's just kind of cut short, and the grounds Certainly. on which she is then going to sort of uh, care for him is borderline problematic if we can use that term without sounding like uh, social justice warriors um i don't know i i didn't i didn't respond to it so unreasonably as you did <laughs> I, I i just think that the film is is uh you know uh, building toward a really powerful uh sort of understated tragedy mm not like a tragedy of like not the tragedy of you know Ron falling off a cliff and yeah, dying yeah. Uh, I don't think that would have been a good ending either yeah yeah uh, sure I, ju- I just think that the playing out of that um social paralysis mm. and that is very real and very uh relatable and very powerful and mm. it seems to be where the film is going it seems to be all the pieces all the all the the you know blocks that are being put in place to, to build for that but it just doesn't <laughs> it just it's it just feels like a tacked on hollywood happy ending yeah yeah well uh, in many ways it was uh yeah i mean but you can i mean and to say to say you don't read their future as certain i mean couldn't you say that about every happy ending sure yeah yeah you know i mean and i and i do <laughs> <laughs> uh, just like yeah, but it won't last though. Once those credits are over, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, uh, it's, here, let it's... me ask you a question. Actually, sorry to, okay. to go back to how annoying the children are. Yeah, uh, you know, they're both they're both like visiting from college. Yeah, uh, and Kay is uh, coming back and like regurgitating all this like social studies, like, these catchphrases where she's like. Yeah, like lording her new like undergraduate knowledge of like Freud and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Over her, over her mother, uh, and she's like absolutely insufferable. And my question is, is she supposed to be funny? Are we supposed to be laughing at her or not? Do you think? As opposed you know, to you what? Know, you know, well, you know the way or... in which you know the way in which like say for example some of the films that Hitchcock made around the same time like uh, mm-hmm. Spellbound and things mm-hmm. like that. The presence of psychoanalytic theory like sure. it's make it's making its way into popular culture yeah um is that are we supposed to be kind of going oh that's really interesting what she's saying about freud or are we supposed to be laughing at how pretentious she is right i see i think we're meant to think of her as kind of insufferable but then right. i do find her insufferable so obviously i'm biased yeah, yeah. towards that <laughs> reading do you do, do i you? find do I find her insufferable? Do you think we're meant to? Oh, oh yeah. I, I, I think. I, I don't know. It's hard to say because I, I, I because think like I'm saying that because like we we cut back to her explaining what the man is thinking, right? Like, oh man, is it a boyfriend that we cut back to? And the fact that we cut back mid conversation to them, so it, it she, she's delivering this dialogue not as something that in any way is meant to be read is like a, this is a film about that or like, you know, I think it's poking fun at that idea that this, this has become culturally prevalent. Uh, well, that's, see, that was my, that was my question because it feels like it, it feels like that now, but I, I think, I don't know whether it, that might've been a little early for that kind of perspective because, on it? Well, because the film itself doesn't then take pains to embed her arguments or reasonings into the actual like the the, the like the macro on a macro level that's not informing I the think, meanings of the film. I think the, the the purpose of all of this 
is simply to demonstrate her sort of sense of superiority to to her mother yeah right, uh, right and then also to, to you know to ron and like whatever her mother's interests are and yeah. whatever her mother's values are uh k is coming back from you know the undergraduate education that her mother has paid for mm. uh and st- is kind of lording it over her it's like just a sign of her immaturity mm. uh but that's i i agree with that but i i think i just i just don't know whether like what you're saying about poking fun at it i just think mm. it might be a little bit culturally it might be a little bit early to, for them to be poking fun at psycho psychoanalysis like that in, at and the, I want... around, at the same time that that although it's not really the same time actually spellman was quite a bit before this wasn't it it was the mid 40s yeah uh, i don't know i think i uh, i mean Cirque's known as this subversive director in one way in which he could be read as that is mm. the you know the the means by which and the extent to which his films do you no know, jump against it um just the fact that, as i said just the fact that like we we cut mid conversation we've already established the fact that she's quoting freud right to the mother mm-hmm. but then later on when we cut back and it is mid conversation and she's still going on about it i don't see how <laughs> okay. that could be read in any other way other than because we don't, we no longer need to characterize her in that way. So the fact that it's doubled and repeated suggests yeah. that it's operating on a comic level to me. Sure. Um, there is other other funny moments where the Fulham's at its most sort of hysterical, although simultaneously plausible in its depiction of social hysteria at the party. Right. So, um, Carrie has many different men sort of vying for her attention and affection. And marriage proposals can come her way on the on the presumption from the men's point of view that she is just wanting a secure life and a bit of security and companionship at that at this age. By the way, Jane Wyman is eight years older than Rock Hudson at this point in real life. Um, she's playing somebody we're led to believe like a generation or half a generation older. But um, at the party, so she takes uh, Ron to the party. Um, hosted by Sarah, her best friend, played by Agnes Moorhead. And uh, at the party, a man um, sort of uh, respond. I think it's Howard, who had... Uh, Howard Hoffer, played by Donald Curtis, who had earlier in the film, you know, proposed marriage to Carrie on the grounds I've just said. Um, now that she's with, like, this young guy, and, the, you know, the, the, the implication there is that this is going to be a, a romantic sexual uh, sexual relationship, marriage not just a means of um geriatric companionship um ron you know springs into uh action and he's actually reacting to the disgusting behavior of howard and i and i think it's really funny like the some of the lines out like that like such as why that man is positively murderous uh or he might have killed poor howard and in sarah's mm. lovely home too <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, so you know, there's there's obviously room in this film for, for comedy. Oh sure, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, there's just that one particular thing about uh, mm. like un- understanding the the dramatic purpose of of having Kay coming back with all that, uh, you know, newly acquired uh, undergraduate wisdom. Yeah, um, just uh, and that. Yeah, as I said, ironically, or as I was going to say, sorry, um, ironically, Cirque's Fulham's have loaned themselves over the years when, when, you know, when, when sort of people's critics started to reclaim Cirque as a serious director, having previously dismissed him on the grounds that he was making, making women's pictures. Um, they began to write about and analyze his films in a very sort of Freudian psychoanalytic way. So, you know, everything in his films becomes a phallus and, you know, the visual language is very sort of Freudian. I don't know. I don't know about that. But uh, have you seen any other Cirque films, by the way? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. No. So I've seen uh, There's Always Tomorrow, um, Written on the Wind, uh, obviously this, uh, All I Desire, um, and Magnificent Obsession. You love those women's um, pictures. I do. I love my women's pictures. Uh no, I, I think this is an extremely good film, though. I, I connect with it a lot. I, I understand completely what you're saying about the ending. Hadn't really thought of it in a way. I do, I like. I mean, I, I thought about it. What would happen if he died? But I get totally what you're saying um, about even that would be kind of a bad ending. 
Um, can you think of a film? Like, I can't remember how Ali Fia reached the soul ends. Does that no, sort of know. rework it into a... Maybe we should have rewatched that as well before... I just think, I just think that... Like, imagine how powerful it would be if she just succumbed to those pressures. You know? Yeah, and or, or like, indeed, like, or if, if, you know, in that scene where she goes to his... And she does make that sort of hesitant decision if he wants to get back, then they can, but then he's nowhere to be found. She makes absolutely no... She's obviously not that bothered because she makes no effort to go and find him or she doesn't stick around. So then mm. starts to drive back into Stonington itself and maybe just end with a shot of him on the hills, you know, just with his uh, yeah. with his pheasants in his hand or whatever they are. Sort of the way Brief Encounter ends, the way that yeah, you know, yeah. she, she goes back to her... So you could, you could have had... Uh, mm. You know, you could have had Carrie marrying one of those other suitors that, you know, is sort of socially regarded as appropriate for her. Uh, yeah, no, that's I, a great I just point. Think, I just think yeah, everything yeah. is so perfectly pitched and incisive up to that point, and then I just think the ending is just terrible. How so. do you read the the um, actual final shot of the film with a deer? Stag. Well, it's not a stag, it's just a deer, isn't it? Um, okay. um Outside of the window. Oh yeah, uh, I see, it seems to be part of the kind of a happy ending, you know. Yeah, like they're all yeah. they're gonna get what they're gonna get what they want. Um, yeah, and yet and yet it 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 seems so well placed to a to the point where it seems perfect to a like like to a suspicious degree, a bit like the robin at the end of Blue Velvet, like. Sure, but like I I understand what you're saying that like. Okay, you can you could take you can read a sort of an irony into the uh, presentation of the final scene, yeah, and you can infer from that, you know that you know it's not going to last or whatever that that their their envisioned sort of ideal romance is not going to uh, ever really come to be. It's going to be, you know, realistically, you know, it's going to be realistic. It's going to be like reality or whatever. But yeah. that is is quite separate from the question of whether she gives into those social pressures in pursuing it in the first place. Yes. So that to me is what's powerful about the build-up, and that yeah, yeah, to me yeah. is what the ending undermines, irrespective of whether the relationship is uh, you know, long-term or successful or fulfilling mm-hmm. or whatever after that, but it's that initial decision to pursue it, you know, despite all of the, all of the social pressures, you know, uh, telling her not to. Um, no, I get it. I get it. Um, I, I, you know, I promised at the very start that we'd discuss the cinematography a bit. I don't know. There's obviously not much to say other than the fact that it's absolutely amazing, stunning, beautiful, yeah, beautiful technicolor. Yeah. Like it on like to a point where that's that for me is the driving component of the film. It points, you know, like imagine watching a 35 millimeter print of that. Wow, that would just be absolutely stunning. Honestly, if if I could, like, if I could watch any film on 35 I like that you know the, if the prince pristine I would probably choose this film yeah I can see I can hear like you're audibly excited at that project <laughs> <laughs> what would you no, think no it's, it's, it's beautiful um, I, I couldn't in, give, in good conscience give it anything higher than a 7 because of how much I hate the ending but wow. it is excellent up to that's brutal up to that point right so before like obviously you'd seen it before but like I don't know if you remember the ending, but like going through where you're like, oh yeah, this is like easily an eight. This is easy like a mm, nine. Yeah, or... yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. Uh, really? Wow. And then, that... and then just trying I think, to remember, I think it's like... seriously. I think it seriously undermines the film. It just it, it, it yeah. runs so contrary to uh, what appears up until that point to be the the uh, theme and the spirit of the film. Mm. Um, the kind of the the understated tragedy of the film is all just like you know yeah contra- no, contradicted yeah. by the final like 10 minutes uh, trying to think you? of a I'm, yeah well i'm trying to think of another example where that is the case like where the ending imposed or otherwise ruins a film to such a degree um or ruins my previous appreciation of it i can't at the moment i'm because you know you're pushing me here like in such a ron kirby rod rock hudson fashion <laughs> for an answer um i'll give it a a very solid to high eight. It's definitely two stars at least on my mm-hmm. star system. But then you know that's because probably even when the f- ending's disappointing, 
I'm thinking about films in very visual and cinematic terms, whereas you're obviously limited to uh, story and uh, yeah. issues of script. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we move Tra- on? Trapped what, in my literary, literary what's prison. Next? What's up uh, next? Next up we have uh, <laughs> Blind Beast. いいこと思いついたわ。なんだ。どうせ死ぬんなら最後にうんと楽しませてよ。泣き出そうと喜ばせてよ。どうする私の腕を切り取ってよ。この体をバラバラにしてほしいわ。どうして。きっと物すごく痛いけど。とても楽しいと思うの。その楽しさの中で。人思いに死にたいわ。Okay, so the third film we're doing today is uh Blind Beast. Um directed by Yasuzo Masumura, uh, based on a novel by Itagawa Ranpo. Um, also released as uh, Moju the Blind Beast, and I also I think re- released later in the US under the title Warehouse, which is not as catchy. Mm. Um, so, a Japanese film released in 1969 originally. Um, this one's pretty easy to synopsize, I would say. Uh, it's about a blind sculptor who uh, kidnaps a young fashion model and takes her to his studio warehouse, which is uh, decorated with all of his bizarre uh, sculptures of various female body parts. And also the centerpiece is two gigantic uh, sculptures of um, a female form, uh, one front and one back. Mm. Uh, He tells her that he'll let her go if she agrees to model for him while he sculpts, uh, sculpts his masterpiece. Uh, and his express intention is to create uh, what he thinks of as an, an entirely new genre of art, uh, specifically for the blind, that would privilege the sense of touch over all other senses. Um, he is aided in this by his mother, who, with whom he, ca- he has a pretty sort of unconventional, uh, dysfunctional relationship that is teased out in the course of the drama. Um and that's kind of about it, really, isn't it? Uh, it goes Easy to, to slightly shoot. weird. <laughs> it goes to slightly weird places later on, but we'll get into that. But that's basically the setup. Yeah. Um, so the first, so it's it's narrated from, uh, Aki. Right. Aki's okay. Point of view. Right. Right. So the the, yeah. So it's a three hander. So we have uh, the model uh, Aki Shima, played by uh, Mak- Mako Midori. We have the sculptor Michio Sofu, played by Eiji Funakoshi, and his mother uh, Shino, played by uh, Noriko Sengoku, um, all of whom I'm sure you are very familiar with. Uh, Less so you heard, Noriko uh, Sengoku, but the other two, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Had, <laughs> had, you, had you heard of uh, this film before? Not, not before you mentioned it. it wasn't on my radar right. at all. Um, yeah, it's probably. I, I think it's arguably the most obscure film that we've covered on the on the on the show so far. And I yet, suppose. watching it immediately, very early on, it shot in extreme wide. It's like cinema scope almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and the attention to composition, I thought, ooh, hello. Uh, yeah. Why, you know, as the horror buff here. Why hadn't Bobby gotten to this before now? That was my question. Uh, yeah, that's kind of the reason that I chose it for this show. I mean, it's, I mean, it's the, <laughs> it's been... I mean, it's the the most obscure film that we perhaps we've perhaps covered so far, mm. um, other than the Darren Aronofsky shorts. But um, it's not that obscure as a film that has a standing as a weird, depraved horror film. Which is why I was I mean, surprised it's, it's that pretty... you hadn't gotten to it before now. Like I, I discovered it just from like the same way that we we spoke on on uh, an episode a long time ago now uh, about angst and how I discovered that one. I was just using mm. the IMDb uh, <laughs> the you... filter filter system to. I thought know, you like... were going to. I thought you were going to say deranged. Sorry. 
<laughs> I probably discovered that the same way. Um, but right, yeah, no, the the just just going through mm. like setting, not not looking for the most popular horror films, but look, but setting a minimum number of votes just to to filter out all the stuff that you know had like, just random stuff. Sure. Setting like a uh, setting a floor of like a thousand votes, right, uh, and then filtering it by highest rated. So that gets you kind of the highest rated sort of cult horror films. And right. this was one of the films on that list. Uh, Why well, I haven't watched it before now, who knows? I don't know. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I, maybe, I, I maybe mean, because I maybe have... because for a long maybe because for a long time I wasn't able to find a uh, um, high quality download of it. I mean, uh-huh. it's, not, it's not widely available. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. I, well, as somebody who doesn't uh, download films, of course, I had to go seeking out a 16mm... No, no. Um, <laughs> I, uh, but my point is that I... I mean, the reason I had that in my mind and why I wanted to ask it is because very early on here, I was drawn in, one might say hooked, if one was on mm-hmm. Twitter writing a hot take. Um, <laughs> and I was very much responding to what I was seeing and hearing and watching unfold. Um, I think you're right. I think the synopsis is very, very thin. It's a, it's, you know, I mean, this could be like a, a, a stage play. I know it's based yeah. on a novel. Um, it actually brought to mind, particularly later on, uh, John Fowles' uh, the, the Collector. The, oh, adapta- sure, yeah, yeah. the adaptation yeah. of which I know you've seen. I haven't mm-hmm. yet, but I, I yeah. like the novel. Um, because it's about the relationship between... Um, somebody whose huh, sense of victimhood has led him to a, 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 a sort of a narcissism, actually, uh, which is quite common, um, and his perse- his own sort of persecution complexes and inferiority complexes um, yeah. have led him to kidnap a woman with the help of his mother, with whom, as you right. said, he has a very dysfunctional relationship. Um, and yet, in order to sort of escape that scenario, the the um, hostage, Aki, yeah, uh, strategizes her way out of it or, or plans to by feigning an interest in him, a romantic interest. Okay, she goes along with it. Okay, I'll do what you want. Yeah. Um, so it becomes about that power dynamic, and what she, so her strategy is to wedge is to sort of satisfy his desires to a point at which it becomes uh, a problem for his mother, whose jealousy is provoked because she has her own mm. sort of uh, relationship to this power play, this two, and, yeah. and, and wants her own say in it. So it becomes this kind of three-way standoff thing that unfolds across time, uh, which which I found really uh, interesting in itself. But the way in which it, it, it's done. I think perhaps this is um, hinted at by the brevity of your synopsis and the thinness of the script, but it's very like subtext is text. Subtext becomes text. Yeah, is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I think so. I, I think it's it's interesting that you um, you said you were drawn into it on the basis of the sort of the the, the very basic setup of the the woman versus her captor premise. Mm-hmm. Um, because it also called to mind the collector for me, but it's actually that's a really, uh, you know, it's a really common premise. You know, it's like everything from from the collector, you know, through to like a movie that I mentioned on the our end of year wrap up was Hounds of Love, which is a similar kind of thing where you have like a, a couple who you know kidnap this woman, and uh, she realizes that in order to to get out of that situation, she needs to exploit the weaknesses in their relationship and drive a wedge between them, which is exactly yeah. what happens in this one as well. Uh, she sees the dysfunction uh, between he and between him and his mother, <clears throat> and tries to exploit it. tries to make tries to make the mother jealous and yeah uh, insecure. And yet, though, what makes it in, what makes it interesting the rend, the rendering of that for me is that very early on. I mean, we'll get to the end uh, in due course, but very early on in those scenes of her uh, Aki strategizing. It's played in such a way that we're not quite sure if she is playing along with it. You mean? I mean, you know, Michio cottons on to the fact quickly that she is in fact trying to trick him, but yeah, she might not be until that. You know, it, it, she kind of—you're never quite sure the extent to which she is playing along. 
Yeah. Well, do you think that at any point you're you're starting to think that she actually is sort of developing warm, well, I mean, warm feelings? Sort of. By the end of the film, it retroactively paints those mechanisms in a new light because in the final sort of twenty minutes or so, yeah, we get a rapid escalation. As the film itself describes it, it's a descent into a non-human abyss. I I yeah. don't know if you want to re, re keep that for a little bit. A well, little let's bit no, let's talk about it now because on. I was gonna okay. I was gonna say in in relation to the the you know captive versus captor, mm. uh, uh, you know generic construct. Um, this is typically classified as a horror film, but up until the last twenty minutes, I would have called it a thriller. Sure, uh, because that premise is kind of like a, i mean it's it's also a horror premise but it depends it was lacking that um sort of extremity or uh kind of macabre kind of quality that would sort of not always but generally sort of delineate mm. horror adjacent thriller from horror uh i mean once even... you get to the last yeah once you get to the last 20 minutes it does it transforms not sorry not only is it classified as horror but it's also often uh, classified as surrealist and I was looking at this film which has bizarre production design yes so let's let's describe the production design a little bit because I also yes. wanted to talk about that that exposition scene at the beginning yep. when he first takes her because he's blind he sculpts in the dark yep. so his warehouse is without windows it's a completely dark like cavernous space and when she's brought in there he is lighting it for her with a torch mm -hmm. uh, so she can only see bits and pieces of it and I love the the fact that they have this exposition to deliver and they decide instead of um, kind of similar to what we talked about in Home Alone 2 where they're on the ice rink. And it's just like if you have this like necessary exposition dump, the you, I mean, you can try to like dribble it out. You just need to get you just need to get this exposition out. You need to put it in. You need to put it in the context of a, a scene that is otherwise kind of kinetic and exciting and, and funny yeah. and interesting. So that's what they do here. They have this exposition dump that they need to just get out of the way so they have him delivering this exposition about who he is and what he wants and what he wants to do and you know why he picked her and all this kind of stuff uh and he's kind of advancing on her with the torch she's backing away and gradually more and more of the uh the sculptures on the wall are being revealed mm. and it turns out that the room is is uh the, the walls of the of the warehouse are covered in sculptures of uh arms and legs and breasts and noses and ears and lips and eyes and, and eyes yeah, right yeah. yeah 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 so all different different body parts and like so each one mm. is they're you know it, it's kind of like almost like biomorphic kind of like cre creepy kind of Whenever you see like loads of eyes like that together, it's yeah. kind of like uh, there's there's a monstrous quality to it. Yes, um, yes. And uh, as I said in the in the introduction, the the center of the room when the room is finally lit is uh, two enormous uh, female forms, one yeah. one front and one back, <clears throat> that they ultimately like get up on top of and everything. But um, I love that. I thought that was like it was a it's a, it's a very long scene. But it like it is, it's, it's yeah. constantly sort of escalating and, and giving you this new visual information. Uh, I thought it was a brilliant scene. Yeah. Um, but I was also thinking about the categorization of the film as surreal or even surrealist with a capital S. And I, I was like, no, like it isn't. You know, this mm. is just because these are weird. Like it, there's nothing. Like this is just like he's. It's put into a perfectly logical uh, thriller context. It's like. This guy is a sculptor. This is his studio, and these are his pieces. And sure, the, fact that the, pieces, the fact that the pieces are weird and creepy does not make the film surreal or surrealist. Uh, but it does very much take both a turn. In I was questioning its categorization both as horror and as surrealist. Mm. And then in the last 20 minutes, it takes quite an abrupt, jarring, I think, turn into surreal sexual horror. So you wanna, do you want to elaborate as sure. to what um, happens? Yeah. So... It's somewhat foreshadowed in the opening scene where yes. she... So the, the opening scene is... Um, uh, open, it opens at an art... Ex, uh, a photography exhibit uh, by some other like artist uh, that, that Aki was the primary model for. 
Mm-hmm. Um, the imagery it's kind of like almost like Robert Maplethorpe kind of yeah I was thinking imagery. That, yeah um, it's, it's like images of her torso and limbs yeah uh, and wrapped chains in and chains like, well, yeah exactly yeah, yeah that, kind of, that kind of stuff um, but there's also a statue in the middle of the exhibit and she sees this blind man uh, like fondling and caressing and groping the statue uh, and th- we're, we're getting her narration of this uh while that's taking place, and at a certain point, it's the statue is based on her, and at a, at a certain point, uh, she says that she started to feel as though the hands of the blind man on the statue were uh, on her body, mm-hmm. that her, sta- her the statue and her body were the, one and the same, mm-hmm. and that foreshadows the direction that the film goes in the final twenty minutes. Which, uh, so okay, through the course of the film, she she tries out all of these kind of schemes to manipulate her way out of the situation that she's in. One of these ultimately does successfully drive a wedge between uh, Michio and his mother, and it results in a kind of a tussle uh, where the mother tries to kill Aki, tries to strangle her, and Michio uh, sep- forcibly separates them, and his mother hits her head and, and dies. Uh, and as kind of a revenge for that, for a revenge for causing him to you know, inadvertently kill his mother. Uh, Michio takes Aki back into the warehouse and rapes her. Um, and then that's when it takes this kind of weird, jarring turn where we again get Aki's narration and it's, she basically like is starting to fall in love with him. Well, the the line um, that, that, so we've returned to the voiceover and the line is, he made love to me. Yeah, I was wondering how accurate a translation of the Japanese that is. Because mm. The semantics there are very important. Um, Absolutely, um, but, but what what then unfolds and quickly escalates suggests that there is a there is a mutual um, affection, um, yeah. if not and, need or dependency or whatever. I think this is a, I think this is a really really great film about. Okay, so you got it. The the obvious. I'll agree. The well, let's, sorry. Let's 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 just let's just go as far. Let's go right to the end then in, with the summary because that creates like you, you said they descended into a what is a non-human it's a, space. It's a descent into a non-human space. abyss. And okay, a non-human abyss, and uh, that abyss consists of like a constant sort of escalation of like extreme um, masochism, mm. and you know they're they're trying to experience kind of extreme they're, they're trying to experience extreme physical sensations with no sort of real differentiation between pain and pleasure and you know they're cutting each other and uh eventually anyway it, it escalates to the point that she wants to die uh but she they've already kind of stabbed each other and they're they're gonna die anyway but she wants to die in ecstasy so she uh she gets him to cut off her limbs and he goes and gets a knife and a hammer and he chops off one by one, chops off her arms and her legs, and with each chop, the legs and arms of the statue break off. So yeah. So um, what happens is so that that was foreshadowed from the opening scene where she says that you know she identifies with the statue, and it's also foreshadowed by the cut off limbs on the walls of the sure of the cellar. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just to describe that for those who haven't seen the film and kind of more specific editorial terms we're not actually like it's we cut away from an image mm. of him about to cut off her yeah it's not gory and then we cut to an image of the floor and it's quite startling when it first happens it is yeah yeah because you, you see you, you, you the see you see that falls the, on the floor is that of the statue is, and not her well, exactly yeah because so you're expecting with the cutaway you're expecting to see the severed arm yeah the so floor, then it turns into statue, some kind yeah. of like Jan Schwankmeyer thing almost it reminded um, me of. It actually reminded me of um, Alejandro Hodorowski. Like the right. yeah. pr- the production design felt initially to me like some, very much something out of uh, like the Holy Mountain or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And also the um, the treatment of kind of like sexual perversion and sexual horror mm. in the in the last like twenty minutes is very kind of like you know the <laughs> the the total disregard for any sort of sense of like. Uh, political correctness um, in yeah. the the development of the of the concept is also something that kind of uh, is pretty reminiscent of of Hodorowsky, mm. also from the kind of the same period, you know. 
Yeah. I mean, come back to the question of the horror. For me, I was never really questioning it as such, um, although I completely understand what you mean. So for me, like the fact that the walls like bear the the subject matter of the film, right? It's like the architecture becomes an extension of it's like mise en scène as mindset almost. Sure. It's um, a kind of an, an interior exterior sort of yeah. uh, uh fusion. Which I know you've 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 said it's like logically explained and uh, mm. you know he goes at great lengths to say well I've sculpted this but it's, it's it almost took him six like, years to, to yeah, create it and yeah. It's it's like it reminded me a little bit of what you said in a previous episode about Ten Rillington Place, like how you know the the walls become like an extension of that interior, oh, yeah, like, a, like a kind of a psychic space. Yeah, sure, yeah. absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's that, and that's that's the cool thing about it actually is that you know the the interior exterior thing with the the blindness um, element as well. With cause he, obviously he sculpts in the dark, so sure? uh, you you have this. You don't see this necessarily, nor could you. But uh, uh, the, you have this this suggestion of of him working in his uh, <laughs> this, this um, insane art. This like the, the it's, instead of the mad scientist, it's the mad artist, right? Mm. So it's like him alone in his in his uh, cavernous s- studio space, uh, mm. surrounded by disembodied female body parts. You know, like. Uh, Almost like the 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 darkness inside a human body, yeah. you know. Well, there's the, isn't it mentioned later on, like the the, the the returning to the womb, like that. That's like sure. a predicate on which all that pain pleasure principle merges. Um, right. Which is which is why I was going to say. Um, I think this is a really great film, firstly, but it's a great film um, about many different things in an extremely simple way. It's one of those text subtext mm. things that feels kind of simultaneously essayistic, uh, dr- dramatic, um, discursive. So you've got, in obvious terms, you've got the artist-muse relationship and the allegory that yeah. stands for that. You've also got the, the mother-son foundations of that. But what I sort of connected to was this the idea that this film is about... Um, sort of bodily love and or trust um, as in itself a kind of a Stockholm syndrome and the violent mechanisms by which dependence and need function. Like, and it, that's very, very gendered, but it makes complete sense to me. Um, so that, that mm-hmm. whole thing about being politically incorrect actually makes the Fulham very readable in terms of a critique of political that politically sure. uh that political uh current yeah um, i think it's a really fascinating film about about misogyny and yeah. uh you know like the his his uh not and not only his but like the the cultural um you know like a kind of a, a central like concept in in rape culture of uh seeing women as an assemblage of desirable forms mm-hmm. yeah you know uh that you know the the kind of the, the fetishization of certain uh, female body parts, and uh, he's literally, uh, you know, <laughs> t- d- disembodied them and then sort of sorted them by type on the wall. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. It made me wonder if um, Kubrick had seen this film two years before um, *A Clockwork Orange*, because the Karova milk bar, the, the set design for that, seems very much linked to. The mise en scène mm. of the uh, of the cellar here, you know, with the the women form like the women's uh, torsos, etc., forming mm. chairs in that film, sure. um, and that thing that you touched upon about the 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 pleasure um, pain thing merging at the end, and that t- being taken to its gruesome, grisly conclusion, although not visibly so, um, mm. that kind of comes back to the idea of elevating touch as a primary sense and to an art form and what would it be if touch was an art form because like when he said that i was thinking well you already are mate you're a sculptor <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> sculpture yeah. is an art form but um yeah like i like that also <laughs> you know what i thought was a really funny detail uh he at the beginning when he first brings her to the to the warehouse uh mm she's she basically says you know 
well, you know, people are going to find me, you know, they're, they're going to be looking for me. And he says, yeah. uh, you know, no, I, when I, when I read, oh, he, he, when he, when he abducts her, he, he is, he is sent to her apartment, uh, as a masseur. Yeah. Um, and she, so basically, basically like he, she, she thinks that through the, the massage company that they're going to be able to track him down. And he says, Oh no, I, re I registered, I registered under a different name when I registered as a masseur. Uh, and he, he also says, uh, um, and we changed taxis several times on the way here. <laughs> Well, you, you, he chloroforms her in the apartment and then just like drags her from taxi to taxi. Yeah, um, seems a little counterintuitively conspicuous yeah. to me. But, uh, anyway. <laughs> um, oh yeah, we should also say sorry in in terms of the the surrealist elements that I was kind of waiting. To, I I thought okay, this has been miscategorized. Uh, because mm -hmm. it's because it's weird it's been categorized as surreal or surrealist uh but no that certainly the we we mentioned the um hacking off of aki's limbs that result in the breaking off of the statue yeah but also uh aki uh begins to go blind once once she yeah, develops that's interesting. Um, yeah once she develops uh an identification with uh michio uh, we get her narration again throughout, throughout the whole sequence. Uh, the sequence is largely narrated by Aki. Um, she starts to inexplicably lose her sight, which is another uh, surrealist touch. So I, I, I do. It, it is surrealist sexual horror, but yeah, uh, I think you know backloaded. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree. Had you heard of um, Masumura before, the director? No, not at all. But uh, in, oh, in doing, he's quite prolific. Tiny, yeah, yeah, a tiny little bit of research after this because I was so impressed by the film. Um, gives me two further titles that he, in which he sort of dealt with similar themes. Um, oh, okay. Daini no Sio and Manji. Oh, oh really? Manji. Okay, because I, I, um, I also, I went on, I went on Letterboxd and went to his his uh, uh, page and I sorted by genre. I sorted by horror first, right? Uh, and yeah. then that gave me two. That gave me two titles. I can't remember what the second title after Blind Beast was, but I was looking for something that kind of felt like it was in the similar vein to Blind Beast, and that one didn't. So then I sorted by thriller, and I found one called Irazumi. Mm. Uh, I'll just read the right. synopsis here because I'm, de I'm definitely going to see this. Uh, in this elegant proto-feminist shocker from Yasuzo Masamura, a woman forced into prostitution wreaks her spidery revenge. A mysterious tattoo artist uh, puts his masterpiece, a human-faced spider, on a kidnapped woman's back. She and her lover are then forced into a conspiracy-born nightmare where they face the danger of becoming the very evil they seek to escape. With each new bloody incident, the spider's face seems to redden with an ever-growing hunger. Oh, wow. That sounds, sounds pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. That was made three years before Blind Beast. Right. So I'm studied definitely going to check that out. Studied, apparently, in Italy for a while under Antonioni, under, yeah. Fellini, and Visconti, which would suggest yeah, yeah. Uh, might account for the beautiful widescreen compositions here. Mm. Um among other things. Would you give it yeah. an 8, I'm guessing? Uh, yeah, I would do, that's easily an 8, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you too? It's, yeah? it's, yeah, I mean, yeah, again, easily. Uh, two stars, borderline three, maybe even, because, like, there's just the depth of material from such a, a sparse, sparsely sort of uh, created universe. Mm. Um, it kind of works in obvious ways, but then it lends itself to like further discussions. Um, yeah. yeah, like just it's. I think I probably it's a, if I, if I have a criticism of it, I probably would have preferred a little bit more of a logical sort of progression uh, between the the kind of what you might call the second and third acts. You know, uh, it's it, okay. it felt like a bit of a jarring leap when it finally revealed itself to be surreal sexual horror. Um, it's weird as well because and, and if you what, you, what any... you were saying about sorry, what you were saying about um, being very subtext heavy, mm. you know that it, that is something that I've complained about with certain other films uh, mm -hmm. before. Yeah. But, um, no, no I, but I, I, just, I thought it was really excellent. Yeah, yeah, just just like I mean, the, the thriller level operates logically; the horror kind of doesn't, and mm, yeah. maybe it would be strengthened if they were working concurrently. Rather than yeah. in sequence, because one seems to lead sure, yeah, to another yeah, one, right? Exactly. Um, but like that, that idea of like you know, it's it's a it's a rich film, I think, about a rich 
long-standing tradition of men sculpting women, either mm-hmm. through like like molesting them, even like figuratively in terms of clay in this instance, or literally in terms of flesh and skin, uh, as is touched upon in the scene in which as a, he's posing as a blind masseur and you know trying it on with her. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, I just I just found it um, an extremely sort of rich poetic work. That nevertheless is very sort of, as I said, essayistic and sure, yeah. Discursive. But yeah, no, very, very good. Yeah, very, very good. Okay, uh, we move on to our final film here. Yes, yes, which yes. is uh, Paradise Alley. So come on, come on, come, 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 come here, come here, out of the shadows. Let me look at you. War hero, huh? Well, what's your name? Lenny. Well, listen to this, Captain Lenny. Before you want to bet any cash on your man. You gotta get a name, a big name. Ain't that right, big glory? Then you can bet some cash on him. You guys gotta have a good record before these jerks around here will bet heavy jack on him. I'm not talking about those five and tens, neither. I'm talking about that hundred dollars you stole from me, you creep. My man wasn't in shape. So what are you saying, that's all there is to it? Yeah, that's all there is to it. Come on, I promise you, 50 wins before Christmas, what do you say? <laughs> 50 wins, huh? Listen, punk. Your man gets in the ring 40 or 50 times before Christmas. He won't have enough brains to tie his shoelaces. Then you'll have two cripples in the family. So, Paradise Alley, released 1978 by Universal Pictures. Uh, as I mentioned in the introduction to the show, it was the directorial debut of Sylvester Stallone, who also wrote the script, and it was produced by uh, Edward R. Pressman. Now, the, the story takes place in 1946, Hell's Kitchen, New York City, straight after um, World War II, and it follows uh, in, I suppose rambling fashion let's say the conti brothers uh, we have cosmo played by stallone himself who's a broke uh down on his luck although he's also a heart on his sleeve a con man type trying to make a book uh we have lenny uh conti played by armin desanti uh who's a war veteran who's recently returned home to take up a lonely miserable job as an undertaker and then we have victor who for many many years uh who's been hauling ice for a living played by Lee Canalito. Victor's in love, get this, Victor's in love with his girlfriend Susan, played by Amy Eccles. Uh, Cosmo is in love with Annie, played by Anne Archer, the former girlfriend of Lenny. Uh, and that gets a little complicated when Lenny decides he wants to get back with Annie, uh, who we must say uh, has trouble taking Cosmo seriously and never really fancied him properly anyway. And although Cosmo... Cosmo, sorry, also has an ongoing friendship come dalliance with prostitute Bunchy, played by Joyce in Gauls. Now, amidst all of this, the Conti brothers brush up frequently against Stitch Mahone, played by Kevin Conway, a small-time hoodlum and bar owner who has a henchman named Frankie the Thumper, <laughs> played by Terry Funk, uh, the real-life wrestler, against whom Cosmo um, will enter Victor into matchups for money, such as, for instance, an arm wrestling contest uh, in order to make some uh, profit, uh, which in the second half of the Fulham develops into an actual rags to something resembling uh, Rich's story involving Cosmo and Lenny becoming Victor's wrestling agents, at, like actual wrestling, entering him into bouts at the local club, Paradise Sally, where priorities and principles are compromised on the part of Cosmo and Lenny um, as they tussle over who uh, has um, a legitimate, legitimate claim to being Victor's agent. And it leads towards a final showdown in the ring between Vanky, uh, Vanky? Between Victor and Frankie <laughs> the Thumper. <laughs> Which the which leads to a final showdown between Victor and Frankie and Thumper in the wrestling ring. Now, I suggested this film for our episode uh, because at one point, get this, it was on my top 100 films of all time. Mm -hmm. Watching this for the first time, were you aware of that fact? And were you surprised by it? Yes, I was. I was aware of it, and uh, 
<laughs> I, I was pretty excited to watch this. I, I was expecting to like it, and also I kind of when when I found myself when I found myself not really liking it, you know, maybe kind of like thirty forty minutes in, I uh, I was pretty disappointed because I have <laughs> not liked uh, <laughs> the past what three of your picks. I don't think I think um, we could should be, maybe just change the composition of each episode of The Habitus, because I, I, I've, I've honestly lost all confidence in recommending films to you that you haven't seen. This is the last one. Well, they're, they're, oh, God, so they're trending upward, because <laughs> we're, we're talking about, like, 30... <laughs> we're talking about 36, followed by The Lusty Man, followed by Phoenix. I don't know, I'd probably take Phoenix over this marginally, but we're, we're, we're getting better. Wow, I forgot about Phoenix. The, 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 yeah, yeah. So it's the last four. Um, the last. So now this is makes it four in a row that you haven't liked. Yeah. So I was, I was, I was disappointed that I wasn't enjoying it. I do think it gets better in the second half, but, uh, yeah, I, I'm very surprised that because it's not that well liked of a film either. Well, um, this is so okay. All cards, all cards, all hands on deck. All cards revealed here. In the process of rewatching this for the umpteenth time. Having not done or felt compelled to revise my top hundred since twenty fifteen, um, I was thinking, yeah, this is this is nowhere near top hundred material. But personally speaking, but I can see why I included it in the past because I was trying to leverage my cultural capital, <laughs> of which I have a lot, um, and trying to draw attention to a film that I think is underrated and unsung and undersung. Because uh, I still think, and I still think that, I still stand by the fact that it's underrated. So, again... And that's kind of, that's kind of like, our, our it was never really our mandate on The Habitus, but we have, you know, sort of gravitated toward films that we kind of feel that way about. Yes. You know? Like, uh, I mean, one of one of the films that we, we just talked about, All That Heaven Allows, is kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm forgetting one or two, but I, I think it was kind of the first film from from the canon that we we really talked about yeah everything else has kind of been a little bit like overlooked underrated under song yeah so uh yeah um Do you, yeah i mean i i imagine many many people listeners now will be seeking out blind beast um sure and won't even be yeah. listening to this segment on paradise sally because they'll be busy <laughs> seeking out that but um i i like this so um, it has a it has a as i said in my synopsis it sounded judgmental. It was kind of only half meant as such. Uh, where the film follows its subject matter in rambling fashion, right? So it's a film yeah. that I would describe. It's a narrative that I think floats rather than flies. It sort of floats by with like oddly timed dissolves between scenes rather than like punchy cuts. Um, and we're never really like. It has a premise, of course. I mean, it's a drama, so it has a premise, but it never really gets going into something that we then become aware of as the driving force of the film, if you know what I mean. Yeah, it's not like, I mean, I, I part of part of my disappointment while watching it was that I was going to disappoint you again. Yeah, uh, yeah, but yeah. The other, the other part, the other part of it was uh, that I, I was looking forward to it. I was like, okay, you know, I like Stallone in this period. Uh, I like I like Rocky. Mm. I kind of I thought I thought of this as sort of like okay a period, um, you know, but like like the the the, the wrestling Rocky. It was kind of what I was expecting, right? Okay, with a period setting, yeah, the depression era setting. And I was like, okay, that sounds that sounds good. Um, but the first thing that jumped out at me as a problem that was keeping me at a distance from it was the tone. Or the fact that there are two like wildly diverging tones, mm. uh, like from moment to moment, mm -hmm. uh, like a like the opening scenes, a uh, uh, an impromptu race across the rooftops. Yes, where they have to jump from building to building to building, and uh, you know you can see where it's going. Like I, I was thinking, okay, one of them is going to fall, mm. and that's going to be like the inciting incident. Mm. And sure enough, one of them does fall. And it's uh, you mentioned Stitch Mahone. It's one of his uh, associates that mm -hmm. falls. Um, and I thought, okay, he's fallen. And then uh, Cosmo comes back and looks over the roof, and he's like hanging from a clothesline, like a cartoon, <laughs> um, right? Yeah. And, uh, I I was like, oh, okay, that's weird. And it's played for laughs. Mm. Uh, 
and then um Stallone's kind of like motor mouth performance where he's like dropping like one liners yeah. and all, like he's, at times he sounds almost like Rodney Dangerfield. He's yeah, like, you know, all these like self deprecating one liners, uh, and like the gangsters like Stitch Mahone and his crew. They're, they, I mean, honestly, like they start they start out almost like like uh, the gangsters in like Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy film. Yeah, or like Bugsy. You know, they, they start they start out like them. Right. They. I actually haven't seen Bugsy, but the they, they late, later on they they turn into almost like the the gangsters from the Bugs Bunny cartoons. You know, and it's like that was a huge problem for me because they're the antagonists, right? And they are just ridiculous and like annoying. Uh, and you know, that's that's where it's it's all building to a kind of a confrontation with their guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's one of the tones of the film, and then the other one is the more grounded tone that I was expecting, and that mm. was more reminiscent of Rocky, uh, like in in uh, Cosmo's relationship with. Uh, with uh, what's the name of the prostitute? Uh, Bunch, Bunchy, uh, Bun- Bunchy. Bunchy. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. So his relationship with her, mm. or uh, or Lenny's relationship with uh, with Annie. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah. All that kind of stuff. That was that was all fine. Um. But no. anything else you want to say? Any any other negatives you want to uh, have chest before? Yeah. I mount sure. My plenty. Yeah. The film? Plenty. Go ahead. Go now, ahead. Um, so you're totally right. It's got those two term, uh, t- those two tones, and a complicated tonality to it. Um, so you mentioned the opening race over which we see the opening credits, and even that unfolds to the tune of Sylvester Stallone's own voice, by the way, because he sings the title track. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's also unfolding in slow motion, which intermittently freeze frames as well, which. Mm-hmm. suggests the film is going to be unfolding in a kind of nostalgic register, I think. Um, and that nostalgia is the sort of umbrella or blanket thing under which that serious, cartoonish um, dynamic um, exists, I think. Um, that's not a defense, it's just a very accurate description of the film, critically. Um <laughs> <laughs> so you've got is it Rat who who falls off the roof at the start and then in the in yeah. the in the bar later on you know he gets out a knife and like you know like if a knife gets brandished in a bar in any film you don't really even if it's played in even like in a film like I I know this might not even be the case in which a knife gets brandished but like something like Back to the Future. Like that kind of tone to it, where like you're not expecting the violence to escalate into a stabbing, yeah. But the very yeah. the very visual impact of it being brandish, brandished, brandished yeah. is inherently like violent and suggestive of dark violence and like a, a like a veneer of uh, a, a certain dangerous milieu, let's say, unmistakably. And yet, we we never really feel that the Conti brothers are in peril. Or in danger, you never really feel that any sort of harm's going to come to them. Um, yeah. So, like, have you seen the film, the Alan Clark film? Like, that's a film no. in which violence is meet. Oh, maybe I, I think should meet the Tom Cruise one. Maybe I should. I've seen that. <laughs> yeah, that's a bit different. And maybe I should <laughs> recommend that as my next. Anyway, so let's not think about what I sh- films I should start to recommend. Um, so you've got. I think this is a film about losers. That's my point. I think you've got charming losers as as in the Conti brothers and you've got repulsive losers um as in Stitch Mahone's crew who like to think of themselves as the local hoodlums um but are very actual in actual fact far from it and are pitiable creatures who in the end may as well just like you know be shake shook hands with and you know become the Conti brothers pals um so there's that, I think. I, I like what you've described, I totally get, but I don't see it as a as a weakness in the film. I think it's just operating in a very different tone and register to what you were expecting, perhaps. Um Well, I mean I think it's it's at odds with itself tonally. Mm. Uh, but I, I also but I think the the uh I mean not not to say that a film has to be monotone yeah. at all, but you know, there's there's a way to balance tones and uh, not kind of like lurch in a jarring way from 
you know, making Rocky to making Dick Tracy. <laughs> I think uh, that's being overly sort of binary in your your descriptors. I I really really don't like Stitch Mahone and his cronies in this at all. Uh, I I not only do I not like the way they're played, uh, I think that they are. I think they're the rivalry with the with the uh, the Carboni br- brothers. Uh, is shallow and disconnected from the rest yeah. of the story. Sorry, I've been calling uh, them the Conti brothers. I have Bill Conti. Yeah. <laughs> Bill Conti, who did the music for the, the, the film, Car- I have him in mind. Sorry, the, the, Car- the, the Carboni, Car- Carboni brothers, Cosmo, Lenny, and, and Victor. Uh, so the fact that... Because like the, 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 other, the other aspect of the story that is sort of flagged up early on and then completely forgotten is the love triangle mm-hmm. that you mentioned mm-hmm. uh, between... Uh, Lenny, Cosmo, and Annie. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and you th- you think that's going to develop in some way, and it's really just forgotten. The love stories, both of the love stories, don't really have any sort of resolution or or climax mm-hmm. to them. Um, and the character who ultimately is put into direct conflict with, you know, the ostensible antagonist of the story, Stitch Mahone and his yeah. his his crew, um, is is Victor, who is the least developed of the three brothers uh, and whose relationship with uh, his girlfriend, Sue is given hardly any screen time at all. Mm. Um, So given the disconnection of, of stitch Mahone and his crew from everything else going on in the story, plus the register in which those, uh, you know, performances are delivered. Mm. uh, Plus the fact that it's the least developed of the three Carboni brothers who is ultimately put in conflict. Uh, Plus another thing that I'll bring up in a second results in in a film that just feels like it's structurally all over the place. And and when you finally get to the point where everything has been, you know, again ostensibly building toward, it just has no effect at all. It just it just doesn't land. The other thing that I was going to bring up is, and I know that this film, I know that Stallone was forced to cut quite a bit of material out of the yeah, movie, yeah, significantly. Um, according so to I him. don't I don't know whether I don't know whether. Uh, whether that's to blame for this, but uh, we have a sort of a simmering rivalry or resentment or conflict between Lenny and Cosmo mm-hmm. introduced at the beginning of the film, where there's not not more more like a more like a clash of personalities, I suppose. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Cosmo self identifies as a kind of a you know entrepreneur, yeah. Um, and he Lenny is more sort of settled and quiet and. Uh, introverted mm. and their relationship to Victor is very different and it's it's ultimately or sorry initially it's it's Cosmo who pushes Victor into wrestling and Lenny is very protective of him and wants him to, wants to sort of you know uh, doesn't doesn't want him to get involved in it because he's only going to get hurt uh, and then there is a montage scene of Victor winning all these matches Lenny ultimately has uh, agreed to be his manager, his yeah. handler. Yeah. And in the course of the montage, Lenny and Cosmo switch places completely. Yeah, it's a double. Where yeah. <laughs> Lenny, Lenny becomes this like, uh, you know, like horrible, heartless, like mercenary, um, you know, sports manager who doesn't really care about his uh, the, the the his his player or his his his, his uh, fighter. Yeah. Um, and. Cosmo becomes this like concerned brother, you know, mm. and I I couldn't believe like that. That's do you, like do you know what the material that was cut from this film consisted of? Did uh, it? No, I don't. But it was, <laughs> did, did, did it put that into I was some sort of to bring up independently of your savage uh, takedown? Um, do you think the rapidity and the extent to which that double switch occurs is plausible? Because it's forty fights. No, I think it's I think it's outrageous. It's I think forty it's fights. The montage suggests it's forty fights later, right? Uh, Vic does won yeah. forty fights in the wrestling ring. We'll come back to the wrestling point in a moment, which suggests if the if the if the club Paradise Alley is open every night and there's a fight every night, at at tops, right? At, at, sorry, at minimum, it's forty nights after. So it's taken forty mm. nights for Lenny to become this calculating like inhuman uh manipulator or victor who's forgotten the fact that he he's in on this with his two brothers um yeah. and it's taken obviously the same amount of time for cosmo to you know this is why i said in the in the in the synopsis priorities and principles are compromised and shift sure. um 
So the question is: Is it is it pl- is it psychologically plausible that <laughs> yeah. that such a transformation would take place in Forty Nights? No, but even if <laughs> even if even if you <laughs> and and even if it, even if it were yeah uh, plausible for it to happen so rapidly yeah you would think for the purposes of like you know dramatic engagement that it would be mm. uh, you know foreshadowed in some respect. It wouldn't be so like such a stark inversion of personalities yeah. Uh, but but even even if you forget about forty nights and let's say, let's say it was four years or something like that, yeah. Uh, in which case it would be, you know, hypothetically plausible. Sure. Um, that would be the story to tell, and you don't just like elide it completely and just have a montage that basically just says, "Yeah, this has happened." I mean, uh, um, now these characters are completely different. According to Stallone, the um, studio imposed forty cuts. That amounted to 40, 40, 40 scenes. Minutes, 40 scenes? Yeah, wow. 40 scenes. And it really? was much, much longer. Scenes. But then he, you know, he rec- like, this is this is what he said to Roger like Reaper. A, that he, he, just, he just showed he showed all the 40 wrestling matches. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, let's let's get away from the merits or demerits of the film, <laughs> right, for a moment. Mm-hmm, okay. Oh, you really don't like this. Um... The, no, the, I don't, the see. Like that's, that's, intri- that's not necessarily true. I know, um, I know. I'm... There was there was stuff I, there was stuff I liked about it. Uh, well, sorry, go ahead. Oh well, you know, don't waste any time telling me those. No, no, no. Um, oh, okay. I, I, I really sorry. I, okay, I really did like uh, the character of Glory. Um, big Glory, big Glory, yeah, yeah, big Frank played McRae. by Frank, Mc- yeah, yeah, McRae, who who's like I, I thought like I want the film to be about him. Uh, so Big Glory, played by Frank McRae, he's uh, kind of like the sort of like the big wrestler on the scene when Vic gets involved in it. And he is, he's been doing it for, how long does he say? Eight years or something like that? He's been saving up for... Anyway, he, he, his manager is basically taking him for a ride. Yeah. He's got him living in, like, a boiler room or something like that. Boiler like, room beneath Paradise Alley. Yeah. Right, okay. So, uh, and he's kind of stringing him along, telling him that, you know, he's putting money away for him or something like that and yeah. promising him sort of like a big payout eventually. But it's never going to happen. Uh, and I thought uh, he was potentially... I think he was a really interesting character. Um, wish we got more time with him. Uh, he ends up uh, killing himself in front mm. of Cosmo. Cosmo takes him out for uh, like a night on the town. and It's Christmas. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. Okay, so he takes... Yeah, exactly right. So he takes him out and uh, they get drunk and they sort of bond. And then... Uh, they're on the pier and Big Glory sort of very calmly and decisively announces that he's going to kill himself and um, the reason that he's going to kill himself is that he feels happy for the first mm-hmm. time in a long time mm-hmm. and that when he when he feels sad he doesn't want to I can't remember exactly how he puts it but it, it he sort of he sort of takes this uh, you know moment of, of happiness and levity as, as an opportunity to end his life yeah. And he jumps off the pier, and then they play it as a joke. <laughs> like he lands in a he lands in a pile of garbage on a on a like a on a boat. Yeah, and it's it's weird. It's weird because it's a really like sad, poignant scene, and they they put this like slapstick joke right in the middle of it. Uh, yeah, and then he and then, <sighs> just weird how it's handled. So he jumps off the bridge. Cosmo looks over. He's landed in the garbage. Then there's like, what, what you know? What are you doing? Cosmo's drunk. They're both really, really drunk. And Cosmo is obviously sort of trying to come to terms with the reality that's quickly he's quickly confronted with, and uh, shouts down, "What are you doing?" And then you know, Big Glory, having broken his fall by accident by jumping into garbage rather than the river, he then jumps into the river anyway, which isn't which is no longer like a jump. It's just like. He you flops. Know, he, he, yeah, he flops or rolls over into the water, um, and it's actually it's actually left quite ambiguous whether or not he dies from that. Um, sure, I mean he's floating off with his yeah, he's, but the, like, the, the yeah, dead, I mean we never float, see him but... again, and the tone of the scene is it ends sure. with you know Cosmo looking like really kind of sad into the into the river. Um, yeah, we don't know what happens to him. I mean, he might go off and and you know hang out with uh, Carrie Scott and Ron Kirby. <laughs> Yes, maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's a really great scene. I think when Cosmo and Victor go to see Big Glory, you know, they they talk their way down there as if like you know he's he's busy with appointments and stuff, and they go down yeah. and 
it's just really humbling and revealing of the squalor and poverty on which this and the exploitation in which this world operates and cosmos yeah. sees that victor who has a tendency to take things literally and doesn't really see irony in things is like kind of engaging with big glory um who's seeing things with certain irony um and cosmos just wants to get out of there he knows that oh this is like a bit too much uh this is mm. you know this is nowhere near what we thought was going to ha happen um okay so the wrestling thing though right do you know the the term kayfabe sure okay so you know the the concept of wrestling being you know not fake but scripted so the outcome yeah. of wrestling is scripted and in the yeah. ring the wrestlers work together with the referee to work the crowd and to work that into basically what is a sort of live staged soap opera right yeah. This film, the wrestlers aren't scripted anything. They're like literally fighting in a competitive combat of mode where the outcome Right, but is that is that not is that not <laughs> re like is that not there like there is like Olympic wrestling too. Yeah, but like the moves you know, here are like elaborate yeah. staged wrestling moves. Like you can't throw somebody over in the way that these guys have thrown each yeah. other over and you know their dress code and everything else they're not olympic wrestlers it's being framed and like presented as like professional like sports entertainment basically rather than like olympic wrestling so i always mm. I, I found that always the tension there like between the comic and the the brutality of it and the savagery uh quite uh like in it's quite consistent with everything else that you said, but rather than reading it as a weakness of the film or dramatic, like flippy floppy nature of it, I, I actually quite like it. But I, and I think, you know, there's that line that is a cosmos is everybody fakes it. Um, which leads back into what I said about like everyone just being kind of losers rather than being protagonists and antagonists in a way. Um, yeah, I think it. I think it just sort of like leads back into that, and I, you know, I say that not as a defense, although obviously, inevitably, it's getting framed as such. Uh, coming as it does after your negative diatribe, um, and I really like uh, Terry Funk's character, Frankie the Thumper. Um, Terry Funk, who like in this film is huge. I knew him twenty years later as a wrestler called Chainsaw Charlie in the WWF. What was then the WWF now WWE um, and tag team partner slash rival of Cactus Jack McFoley um, names that I'm sure you're very familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> but in this film, Frankie the Thumper, or rather Terry Funk, is huge, and like his sort of weird non-dialogue um, contributions to scenes and conversations, I find quite funny. Yeah, and I know you said you hated Stitch Mahone, but like at the end of the film, you know, when Stitch is reduced to standing in the ring um, in women's tights, oh. I kind of feel sorry for him. It's, he's like a pathetic yeah, figure. But that joke, that, what's that joke about? Like, that's, that's, that's so silly. They're not mine! They're not mine! Honestly, like, I... Th so, okay. Oh, actually, one thing I, I thought was interesting... Um, it was quite quite jarring when I watched it. Was uh, the the monkey that that uh, um, Cosmo wins? Oh yeah, for, uh, the, there's an arm wrestling contest with uh, with um, Thumper between Thumper and Victor, uh, yeah. which is kind of what convinces Cosmo that Victor could potentially be uh, like a, a wrestler. Um, mm. He wins against uh, against Thumper, who no one has ever beaten in arm wrestling, and they they win uh, this um, like performing monkey, mm. um, and then. There's a scene where they wake up and in the the room that th the three brothers share, and uh, Cosmo goes over to the like bathroom mirror and he pulls back a curtain, and the monkey is bound with ropes with a uh, like a gag over over his mouth, mm. and he takes the gag off and says something about oh you're going to make me a fortune or something, and then puts the gag back on, and I was like, mm. what the fuck? Yeah, um, and I looked it up, and that scene was cut from the film in the UK because it constituted uh, animal cruelty. Right, yeah. Um, weird, horrible scene. Uh, but, um... I don't know if it's on... Because I have it on DVD. I can't remember this being on the DVD. 
Really? No. Oh well, if it, if it was if yours is the yeah, it's a UK British DVD, DVD, then yeah. It, yeah, well then it wouldn't be in it. No. So wow. I got I obviously obviously watched the American so version. So we've of it, watched but... different versions of the of the film. So actually, yeah, so really, we're, we're reviewing <laughs> a completely different films. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, I mean that's worth looking up if you uh, want to look it up on YouTube or something. But um, does Stallone's rapid talk and annoy you? Yeah, yeah, I find it's an, that's another thing though. The perf- the performance is is like all over the place in terms of. Uh, in certain moments, like he's delivering these one-liners, like he's I don't know, like he's like it's like he's Woody Allen or like like I said Rodney Dangerfield or something, uh, and other times he's playing a kind of a more typical Stallone character. <laughs> he has this he has this fight with with Lenny like in the alley behind the alley behind Paradise Alley, I think, uh, and he's he's like screaming at Lenny as Lenny walks away, and the camera is like doing this like slow dolly in, and it's like the camera loves Stallone. It's like it's such a you know, <laughs> actor's first movie as director kind of thing. Like, yeah. um, is that the, this, is is my that big, the, this is my big Oscar moment, you know. Is that the scene uh, in which he ends by saying to, shouting to Lenny, you're looking old tonight. You're looking old tonight, Lenny. I think so, yeah, yeah, yeah. And Lenny's uh, limping off because, of course, he returned from the war with a limp. Um, did, yeah. But you didn't, you didn't read Stallone's fast-talking nature as, a, as kind of a defense mechanism for his character. You know, keeping sadness and reality at bay, thinking himself as this, you know, quip-heavy entrepreneur who needs to keep talking because the silence is just too unbearable and embarrassing. You don't read that in such a I way. Mean, uh, you could, I'm sure, but uh, I mean, it doesn't make the performance any less annoying. It's, um, it's quite Rocky-ish, though. I mean, I remember rewatching Rocky a few years ago and re- finding Rocky Balboa kind of annoying. You know, the way he kind of smothers Adrian into like going on dates with him and stuff and ooh, 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 whatever. Yeah, but it's all. it's not as it's not as uh it's not like as scripted. It's not as, like a, he's dropping all these like scripted one liners. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um Yeah, like yeah. I have to say I I I gave I gave this like five out of ten. But I, I, I think I might have been a little bit generous. Uh I think I might have wanted to not upset you too much. Um I'll, I'll leave it at a five out of ten for now, but it's it's a low five. It's a, it's a. I mean, I didn't ask what your score was, so you, there was no need to say that. <laughs> um, I just it would have been funny if after you said that for the remainder of the episode, you just don't hear my voice as if I've just <laughs> gone offline, and then you just have to wrap things up alone. Um, this is our final um, episode, by the way. I should have said that at the start, although I didn't know. Um. And I wanted to touch upon, just very quickly, um, the slowness of the film. It's quite slow, and not much seems to happen with re- mm-hmm. in, in, a, in a causal way, in sort of a cause and effect way. Um, and the lighting as well, like, it has a sort of soft lighting to it. Did you, What did you think of its, like, pre- period production? Does it does it feel like yeah, it lived in reality? Yeah, that's beautifully... Yeah. Uh... I don't know, but probably again, sort of up and down like the rest of the movie. Mm. Uh, some of it feels more kind of like, uh, like a you know stylized kind of thing. But um, mm. but maybe the stuff in Paradise Alley with the uh, what is it? Yeah. The sign that comes down, the another bomb. Yeah, like another bomb. Whenever yeah. Yeah. when somebody's been beaten. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, it's it's really nice looking film, all right? Yeah, it's um, a really nice looking film. Wow, such yeah. faint praise <laughs> forthcoming. <laughs> Wow, a backhanded compliment if ever I heard one. Yeah, it looks nice. It's pretty. <laughs> I always it's picturesque. Think, you know, at a festival where I come out of a film and uh, critics are desperate for, like, oh, you know, to form a consensus. Oh, what did you think? You're always in trouble when uh, the consensus is like, well, it looks nice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember I had a, I had like a, oh, I can't remember what the book was. Years and years ago, it was uh, like some sort of like, you know, uh, filmmaking kind of a, uh, primer like kind of primer on filmmaking kind of thing right. and the, the guy the writer was making the same point he was like uh the last re- the last critical refuge is uh is cinematography oh, <laughs> beautiful cinematography <laughs> might be a nice place on which to end the discussion of paradise Alley. to answer your question mine would be eight out of ten i'm gonna i'm gonna would it still away. it would, would not it still, still make be your, my top hundred no no, no this because i've seen did, did, did the Lusty Man get knocked out of your top 100 That's as well? That's also been demoted. Lusty Man was demoted yeah, from a 9 to an 8. This is still at sure. an 8. 
Although, okay. uh, yeah, it actually, this has been demoted from an ancient eight as well. And so tell me, how, how would you rank uh, Stallone's work as a director? Well, this is better than... Okay, so... So you've got this, you've got Staying Alive. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen, I haven't seen Staying got, Alive. Uh, you've got Rocky 2, 3, and 4. Yeah. You've got... Uh, Rocky Balboa, Rocky Rambo. Rocky Balboa, Rambo, and uh, The Expendables. Yeah. I haven't seen The Expendables. Did he do just the first Expendables? or? Yeah, he directed okay. the first one, yeah. Um, so that I think I always had this as, as top. Then probably Rocky IV. Hmm. Um, and then I have a pal who reckons that if Jean-Luc Godard's name was attached as director to Rocky IV, everyone would say it's a masterpiece. <laughs> um, and he very much could feasibly have made that film. Um, then probably Rocky two, then three, and then we're going. You don't rate Rambo, it. no? I hated Rambo, really, really Does hated it? Rambo. I like Rocky Balboa a lot, actually. I didn't really like Rocky Balboa, but nah, I remember. I remember I took uh, when I was the president of the film society in my first of two years as president of film society. Um, <laughs> took took everyone to see Rambo. I mean, we all just sitting there in the cine world, and I almost walked out. I just hated it. Hated it. Why did you hate it? But I, I mean, I've forgotten it to such a degree I can't even mount All a right, critique okay. against it. I just like, oh, isn't it just like a repulsive, disgusting film? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, maybe, maybe I should see it again then. Um, it's so over the top. I, really, I quite enjoyed it. Um, okay. All right. Will we wrap yeah, up? Yeah, yeah. Let's. Let's. Yeah. Sooner the better. I. I stop listening to this savage diatribe. <laughs> okay so thanks once again you've been listening to the habitus um we are as always on soundcloud we're on stitcher we're on TuneIn, we're on itunes now and we are actually finally on can you believe it youtube thanks bobby that's that's your doing yeah um my name's been michael patterson my name still is michael patterson and <laughs> i've been your co-host with with bobby lowe and tune in once again uh, on our next episode. Cheers. Thank you.